Welcome, everyone. Dr. Anthony Credited Fourth here, also known as Dr. Finance. We're on the Dr. Finance Live podcast. I want to introduce you today to an amazing guy, Rick Sedler. Rick Sedler is uh, from the, the Boston area. He's doing incredible things in the publishing industry, particularly the magazine industry, um, luxury magazines. Uh, he's He's got so many incredible things we want to talk about. So welcome, Rick. How are you, sir? I'm doing terrific. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, Rick. All right, Rick. So the formula today, we're basically we'll do a quick 30 second snapshot of yourself. And then um, then we'll do we'll get into your story for about 15, 20 minutes. And then I got an arsenal of about 20 questions to ask you. And then we'll conclude. So that's the format for today. You want to start out with maybe a quick 30 second um, intro of yourself? Sure. So I started out skipping a year of college. I'm going to give it a break. I don't know what I want to do. I'll hold off for a bit. So I got into uh, the moving business. My dad was an antique dealer. He had moving trucks. I moved a lot of expensive furniture. So put an ad out and I started a uh, moving business. It grew. I moved people from uh, the North Shore down in Florida. We stayed in the antique business, went to flea markets on the weekend. And I helped build lobster traps. That's what I did. So after selling people on my service, and then realizing after I sold it, I'd have to move their entire house. I said, what am I doing here? What am I really? Well, I never really showed somebody when I met with them to price out the bid uh, that I could move. It was just through communicating with them. They liked, they trusted me and they listened to my story about moving antiques and they hired me. I had like a 90% success rate. So I said, you know, I need to do something with what I really am good at, which is selling, but not have to move a house after I close it. Uh, so I looked for an ad. I found a publication that had moved from Atlanta. Really interesting. A magazine that dealt with millionaires buying products through a magazine, a magazine called Rob Report. So I applied. In my process, I was reading, trying to trying to decide what to do next. And I and I, I read Think and Grow Rich, Edwin Barnes. He said, Edison doesn't know it yet, but I'm going to work for him. Uh, I want to learn from him and I'll be prepared to work for nothing. So I applied and my manager said, you, there's, there's no reason I should hire you. You're a mover. You sell antiques. I need somebody that's a specialist in closing and selling. So I decided the only way in was to offer to work for free. So I said, I'll work. I'll learn at the end of two weeks. I'll only get commissions if I sell something. Uh, you can throw me out or ask me to stay. So that two weeks turned into a full-time job, which lasted 17 years. Working at Rob Report from a salesperson on a, all the way up to a, a publisher. So that's, that's uh, sort of my story of uh, where, where, I, where I started from, where, where I wound up, and there's a whole lot of details in between. <laughs> so, yeah, so you're, you're now a, um, a publisher. You have your own company now for about 20 plus years. You don't work yes. at Rob Report anymore. And Correct. What are some of the, uh, the the magazines that you own? What are their names? Yeah, so that's the background. That's sort of how I got here. But after that experience, I, I worked for another publisher who uh, launched Elite Traveler, uh, a publication that was on board private jets. And that was sort of the test for me. If I could help somebody and do something other than my experience, it it, it proved to me that maybe instead of climbing on top, uh, the highest level diving board. Maybe I'll just start off, do a dive, see if it works. And then if it, if I feel like I, I can help somebody else with their money, maybe I can launch my own. That was the end goal. So after uh, successfully launching Elite Traveler, I started my own business. And I've had that for 21 years, actually. Hard to believe. And so took my experience with luxury publishing and high net worth individuals, everything I'd learned working for somebody else and applied it to launching um, upscale luxury publications, niche, you know, specific. We do luxury pools and outdoor living. The market is exploding. Can't find a pool uh, builder uh, that has any open schedule for the next two years based on COVID. Uh, we do Ocean Home Magazine, focusing on uh, the lifestyle of living on an ocean. And uh, we have a regional publication, North Shore, North Shore Home, North Shore of Boston. And we have a media buying company called Lux Communications, where we help uh, luxury clients find the market 
that they're looking to reach, which is luxury and it's high net worth people uh, through uh, media buying, through all of the mostly uh, newspapers and publications, but also uh, helping them with uh, with social engagement as well. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate that. All right. So, Rick, I, I want to step back into your, your story. We're, we're going to start from square one. So you're originally from uh, where at in Massachusetts? Where were you born at and raised? Uh, born in a little town called Georgetown. 40 miles north of Boston. Okay. About 6,000 people. And you want to tell us a little about your first 10 years you were in that area for, during that time? Sure. Growing up in Georgetown? Yeah. So myself, two brothers and a sister. My dad was, uh, was a sprinkler fitter. He worked really hard with what he did, and he also had a side hustle of selling lumber. While growing up, I helped my father every day after school and on the weekends. I remember one time asking him, Dad, did, did you want to have kids so that, that, that they can work to help you uh, for, for their entire uh, childhood? Did you, did you just want workers? Is that, was that the plan? Because that's all I'm doing here is helping you. And that Route 95 was opening up. His idea was there are all kinds of great trees that have dropped for firewood let's go and grab trees every day after work every day after school and and pull in these trees and, and bring it back to cut firewood one idea after the other i think i'm the only guy that's in the publishing business that knows how to hand hew a beam <laughs> so all kinds of things that, uh, that 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 we did but mostly it was just uh you know I want to call it hard labor, but it was uh, just helping him with just, he's just one of these people that just worked super hard all day long. So I credit that while I was complaining at the time, I credit that with, with uh, my own work ethic today. That's what I, that was uh, what I was uh, born into. And that's what I thought, you know, everyone does. So yeah, that, that's a snapshot of, uh, of my life. You, you had yeah. a lot of, uh, I guess, odd jobs growing up mostly in the um, uh, lumber business and I, I, what what kind of what, what other kind of jobs did you have did, did, were you a paper boy or any other stuff well you know uh, I don't think I was a paper boy uh, but uh, my dad started to get into collecting antiques and going into flea markets and yard sales so um, my job growing up when I wasn't helping him uh, was uh, buying and selling antiques hopefully for a profit and also refinishing antiques. Um, so I would find a cupboard for $50, restore it, maybe patch it up and put it out on a Sunday morning at a flea market and hopefully get a couple hundred bucks for it. So I didn't have a traditional job growing up. I didn't work at the pizza place. I wasn't a paper boy. I, I was sort of a young entrepreneur in always finding a way to make money out of the opportunities that I, that, that I had. Um, driving around with my dad doing his collecting. I said, well, if I'm going to be there, I may as well uh, start doing it myself. So, you know, I, 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 I almost, with the exception of Robert Point, never really had a job working for anybody. Just sort of found a way to make my own money. Uh, so you, you were always an entrepreneur, pretty much. Yeah, didn't, you didn't, know, you yeah didn't, didn't know what it meant, didn't know what I was. But yeah, and looking back in hindsight, that's what I did. I always found a, a way to to make money and, and, uh, working, uh, between, uh, the early days and, you know, into Rob report, I think I probably had about, uh, five or six different companies. I, um, I sold, uh, diet cookies. I sold, uh, electronic muscle stimulation machines. I sold, uh, I was the U S rep for, uh, uh, Porsche conversions into convertibles from the UK to the United States. I worked at a, a car lot. So, Every one of these experiences didn't make me a whole lot of money, but it it led to gaining the experience to all combined later on use it to make money. So it's all valuable. And I think a lot of people sort of give up. Hey, this is not making any money. This is a waste of time. But I uh, always looked at everything uh, as when it was complete, what did I gain from it? What did I, what value did I get from it? And and it, 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 cer it certainly is valuable, but it's hard to, you know, be be flat broke. Uh, and and have everyone else enjoying careers and and realize that uh, <clears throat> what you're doing made sense at the time. Mm. That's, that's brilliant. And and I don't know if you ever watched the movie <laughs> Slumdog Millionaire 
You ever seen that show? Yeah. It's kind of, it's yeah. kind of like that. You know, I think about what you said and um, how life works in general. Sometimes you're just collecting different events, experiences. And in one day, you never know. They'll be at this one moment when you needed it all. Not a minute before yeah. and not a minute later, just right there, right now. And that's how you capitalize on a moment, which can make you successful, financially successful. And I, and I think that's the biggest missed opportunity is how do you take negotiating at a flea market and turn that into something that can help you negotiate with a, a multi-million uh, uh, dollar uh, CEO, right? Um, most people look at it and say it's not the same, but if you look at it and, and try to understand you know, what you've learned and what, where you can apply that later becomes very beneficial. I think I've done that a lot of different ways and in some, and, and, and some ways, just crazy to think that you can interpret that into something that could be helpful in a totally different industry, but it's worked for me. Thank you, Rick. So, so Rick, going into your, your teenage years, can you describe maybe a few events in your, in your teenage years growing up? What was it like growing up in, were you still in, in Georgetown in Massachusetts? Yes. Um, so I was, uh, I was pretty athletic. Uh, I was a drummer. I joined a band. I, um, joined a stage band, actually played, uh, a performance, uh, with other bands around the country at Radio City Music Hall. My first experience in New York City thought that was pretty cool. Um, I was a class clown. I didn't focus on my studies that much. I wanted to make everyone laugh. Uh, I, I had humor that was sort of risky. Either the teacher was going to laugh or I was going to go to the uh, principal's office. And I, I kind of liked that, uh, that edge, you know, what's it going to be? Uh, most of the time it worked. That's why I continued. But sometimes they said, well, it's the price you pay. It's like sales. You know, you're not going to sell everyone. Sometimes it flops, you know? So uh, I did have a lot of friends. Uh, I think a class of 108 graduating. I think I had 102 at my graduation party last minute. Uh, so, you know, everyone likes to hang around somebody that's funny, right? Fun to be with. I was a little bit crazy, took a lot of risks. And again, that was sort of, you know, when I left, uh, to decide what I want to do, you, you look back and you, 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 you look into your experiences and you try to look into your soul and say, what, you know, who am I, what am I good at? Right. How can I apply this to something else? So that was, um, you know, that was sort of, uh, uh, a, uh, lens into my, uh, my childhood. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate that. So, so Rick, um, what, what happened? Uh, did you eventually go to college or what was, what was those years like around 18 plus? Well, for high school. Uh, so I, I started working at Rob Report and the idea was that I would go to college, you know, get started, get my experience and uh, take a year off. Well, I took another year off. Well, so the answer to my question is I'm, uh, I'm taking, uh, it's my 30th year of taking a year off. Uh, so no, I never went to college and, uh, I gave up on the, eventually I will, I just get so immersed in Rob report. It was just so fun. I started making money. I'm thinking, how can I ever see myself now taking the time to go to college? And I poured myself into books, every single sales training book, everything I could possibly digest to learn. And I viewed it as I did not get trained traditionally. So I had to learn this particular business. And I committed to learning because of my, what I considered a weakness at the time, lack of education, that I would be the most knowledgeable publisher in this space of anyone on the planet. And, you know, that was a goal. That was my mission. And so, you know, sometimes some a new manager would come in, you know, when I was in sales saying, gee, give me your background, your bio, what did you do before? And I remember one particular time they wanted to hire somebody that had an education that was experienced. And, uh, you know, I said, uh, listen, you, you know, I understand why you'd want to do that. But here's the thing. You, you've got to risk somebody that's doing it now with somebody that you may hire that may be the smartest guy from one of the best schools. What if it doesn't work out? And, you know, so the psychology in sales, what I applied at the time, hoping it would work, was in a, in a corporate structure. Everyone wants to cover their butt. You know, they don't want to make a mistake. So I got enough of that concern that maybe I would fail by replacing this guy because he's already doing a good, uh, a good job here. And in the end, he, he, he decided, okay, well, let's, let's, let's see how you do that. 
and uh, managed, uh, you know, a few a few of those times during my career to have, uh, you know, my only experience with working at that company as it began to, uh, to grow and get well known. I had to defend myself a few times until it was at the point where things were growing rapidly, everything was good, and then it was sort of never brought up again. So, yeah, didn't didn't go to college, hustled the whole time, and knew that I had to dedicate myself to learning constantly. And as a result, um, I don't know what it would have been like had I gone to co- a four year college and graduated. You might not but have been a success. Success. Who knows? <laughs> who knows? Right. I, 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 my, my son played soccer uh, with uh, with with another kid, and uh, dad's got to be good friends. And this guy. This guy was a Friday Night Lights football player in Texas that was the quarterback, a celebrity, he said. Whenever I'd go into the har- the hardware store or go to the supermarket, uh, you know, every, every, it, was, it was like I was a professional quarterback. That's just the way it was. And he got um, a uh, scholarship to Harvard to play football, play quarterback. And now he's one of the um, leading um, uh, spinal reconstructive surgeons in the country. And so we're we're traveling to to a playoff game down in uh, in Virginia, and he gets into you know tell me tell me your story tell me your background, and so I'm blown away when he tells me his background and he said wow that's a great story I'm like you think my story is great how can you how can you how, why would you think that's great and he just he just yeah you know, I, I just came from a totally different place when I hear that I just I just can't believe it was possible so at that point he realized that well, maybe it is a pretty good story. Rick, how, how old were you when you applied for uh, the job at Robert Report? I think I was probably 21 or 22. So a few a few years after high school, um, there was a lag time, and then you just and then you yeah. went into the Robert Report, yeah. which yeah. is a proper age, actually. You mature, maturity should be a little bit ready for some, an organization like that. Yeah, it was it was tough though. Um, but, you know, I think it would have been tough to go to any sales job, but that was uh, particularly difficult because if if you would liken it to, say, getting a job at a car sales dealership, um, you would meet with ordinary people buying cars and you'd have to sort of understand what to say and how to close the person and be successful. But my sales job was selling to people that were very successful. They were entrepreneurs, they were millionaires, they were doctors and lawyers, some of, you know, celebrities we would call out of classified ads in various newspapers around the country. And when we found a car for sale, we would have the pub, the newspaper age seven days. So we knew it was still for sale. And when when we got on the phone, we get these, these people that were so intimidating. Are you calling about a Ferrari for sale, a Bentley for sale, or a Rolls Royce for sale. And you try to sell them an advertisement in the, in the magazine. So it was level 10 nearly impossible to be a 20, 20, you know, 22 year old kid to try to sell these people. So part of the learning was to really, you know, act out your position. Somebody described to me, he said, Rick, what you got to do is you forget what you, who you are and what you've done and think of it like you're an actor. Think of it like you have to lose a hundred pounds. Are you committed to do that? If your role happens to be somebody, you know, that's down in, in, in down south who speaks a totally different language. And in order to get the role and be successful, you've got to commit to all these things. Do you want to do that? Because that's what you have to do here. So I really studied and practiced and and um, and said, there's no way I'm going to fail. And I think a lot of people fail because they say, oh, let, let me give it a try. See if it works out. Hundreds of people have come and gone because they gave it. Some people lasted a day. We, we were taking bets. Okay, the new guy's coming in. How long do you think he's going to last? I'll give him a week. Somebody said, I'll give him a day, you know, uh, because it was very difficult. You go in thinking it's a glamorous job and you get to deal with all these people, but it's 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 really tough to be able to present yourself and get, you know, $569 for an ad running in a four-color magazine, in many cases, no one's ever heard of, when the ad that you're calling on was $6 in the local newspaper. So it was, uh, I sort of felt like if I can do this, if I can be successful, I can do anything because this is so, you know, so nearly impossible. But there were 11 people in the room with me in a boiler room. If you ever watch the movie Boiler Room, you'll know exactly what it is. The script that was written for us was so much like the boiler room. When I first watched it with my wife, I actually finished 
one of the lines that the salesperson was using. <laughs> and my wife said, I thought you said you didn't watch this movie. I said, I didn't. Well, how did you know what he was going to say? Because that's my same script. So it was that kind of a room, a boiler room, closing, closing, closing. Um, but it was, uh, you know, talk about training and talk about level of difficulty. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. You know, when, 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 you, when you made a sale, it was just top of the world. Lowest of lows and the highest of highs. Yeah, so you, you really got into the highest level of sales. Like talk about throwing someone right in the deep end to learn how to swim. Yeah. That's where, that's where you were in your early career, just from a young age. Well, so what was I going to do? Was I going to continue to sell? Started to make some good money. You know, am I really good at selling? Uh, I, I, was, I was pretty good, pretty good at selling and became very good at it. But I had somebody from Georgetown that was actually my partner in this moving business I had. And he started to see some of my checks. I would, uh, I would take my check that included the commission for the month and said, look at this. You made that in a week? No, it's two weeks, but here it is. You know, it was really the whole month plus commissions, you know? So I was exaggerating how good I was doing. Um, I need a job. There. I want a job there. So uh, I convinced my manager to give him an interview. And uh, he said, can you teach me what you know? Every single day, back and forth from the office, was a rolling university. Dumped 400 50 pages of a, a training manual into his head, practice and role played. And uh, he became, the funny thing is, that was 38 years ago. He's still there. He's one of the leading watch marketing experts in the world. He has uh, the, the watch category and he travels all over uh, throughout Europe and uh, mostly Switzerland, goes to all the events. And he's so well known. He's been doing it for so long. He can walk into a room and people almost wait in line to talk to him. And he started working from a pizza store. So you trained I, him. Pardon me? You trained him. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know I was, you know, it was only after I start, started to look at it and say, well, am I better as a manager trainer? to help somebody go from a pizza shop to being, uh, you know, a great salesperson. Manager said, all right, I'll do, I'll do him a favor. You seem to be working out. You know, if he's as good as you, maybe, maybe it'll work. And he, he was thanking me for bringing him in. This guy is great. He listens. He'll do whatever you want him to do. And he's just a bull, kind of a bull in a China shop, but he's a bull. I like that. He's very hungry. And just like uh, me and something I made him promise if you get this job, everything you got 24 seven, that's what you gotta, that's the attitude you gotta have in order to make it work. It's not going to be easy. Don't care. I'm in 38 years. How many people do you know that are in a business for 38 years? And he's made wow. a lot of money. He has multiple properties and he's a millionaire many times over. Wow. From a pizza shop. <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and he and he, and he made he made really good uh, pizzas and subs too. That's amazing. So, how long did you stay at the Rob Report for? I was there seventeen years, and uh, I decided when it was into you know ten years, eleven years, what am I going to do? How long am I going to stay here? And I decided I would stay for as long as I continued to make more money, and I was advancing in some level. So I got to be the publisher of the magazine and I worked for a, a family uh, and they relied on me to run the magazine. And I said, well, I can't go any higher because I'm, uh, I, 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 I remember joking once and saying, look, uh, in order for me to elevate beyond where I am now, you're going to have to adopt me. Uh, I'm uh, the publisher and uh, making a lot of money. And uh, will I continue to make more money? So I, I, I made myself a, a promise that if I, if I couldn't make any more money and I felt it was the end of the good times that I would do something else. Well, they sold it and they sold it to, uh, to uh, somebody that uh, did a very good job with taking it from where it was to move it on. But I, I decided that, uh, you know, having many, many years with this family running the publication, it wouldn't be the same with a new owner. He had his own team. The dynamic would be different. Now's the time to leave. So I was recruited to go to Elite Traveler, but uh, it was um, 
it was the the most amazing 17 years in terms of learning and and some of the things that I was uh, allowed to do as we evolved the publication. But it was roughly 500,000 in debt when I started there. And um, it was flipped a few times since then. Uh, one to uh, Kurtko uh, Rob Media, I think you paid 150 million for it. That's what's in Wikipedia. Wow. And um, it is now owned by, uh, and, and, and Dan uh, Gilbert from uh, Quicken Loans uh, 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 purchased it. And I, I think he did a joint venture with Penske Publishing. And it's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And the crazy thing is I had an opportunity years ago uh, to buy it for a million dollars. Wow. And uh, I told uh, somebody that I knew would be capable of uh, investing. And I had approval from the owners. If you get a million bucks, it's yours. So uh, I told them uh, young, too young for that, that if I, um, if I got the million bucks, I could pay it back. You get your money back in three years. I'll never forget what he said. He said, get my money back. I already have my money now. What do I want it back for? He said, I want a big return. This is a risk. I don't get my money back with risk included. That's, that's, that, that's not something that's, that's uh, beneficial to me. That's not even in, in, intriguing. Um, so again, another one of those things where it didn't work then, but it was certainly, I've never forgotten. And it was probably 30 years ago. He said that, uh, but it was, it was, um, something that uh, taught me a lot about what an investor needs to look at in terms of seeing value, right? I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to give you money and I want multiples on return. So I saw him a couple of years ago. I say, John, remember that, uh, that uh, investment opportunity I brought you years ago? Yeah, 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 yeah. I said, well, it just sold for $450 million. Think we should have done that? <laughs> you thought that was uh Funny, but also, you know, sort of looked at me like, uh, don't bring that up. You probably should have. <laughs> That's funny. Rick, yeah. Rick um, if, mind if we step back for a second? I just want yeah. to educate uh, folks on the publishing industry. So the hierarchy. So from where you started to publisher, what, what, is the, what does that level look like? And where does publisher fit on that role? I guess it's underneath owner. And can you just walk yeah. us through from the bottom to the top so we understand yeah. the terms? That's a good question because a lot of people aren't familiar with uh, the terminology and the title. So I went from a salesperson that sold these photo classifieds, and then I moved into selling display ads. So that's kind of an evolution of a, of a salesperson, you know, sell the lower priced items and then move up. And sometimes it's selling classifieds to selling digital, uh, rather display ads, and then into national accounts. So I, I moved through that journey. And along the way, uh, realizing that I wanted to move over to management, I saw an opening and I went to management. So I became a sales manager. After that, you're promoted to sales director. So you direct all the managers. And under that, uh, or above that position, there's a associate publisher and a publisher. So I moved from salesperson through display into manager, into director, and into uh, associate publisher and publisher. So that's the business side of the masthead. A lot of magazines have two different mastheads. One's an editorial creative masthead, the editor in chief, the editor, the writers, person that does all of the uh, designing, creative, production, all that sort of thing. Uh, and the, uh, the other side's the business side. So it may be the, uh, the corporate name and the executives, the president, the CEO, you know, if it's a big company in this company, in this case, it was a, a family run business. So um, most of them throughout, you know, five siblings, most of the time I was there, they rotated family members into the publisher position. Uh, but it was a title only. They had a lot of the benefits, but uh, they, they weren't really hands on. So a publisher is um, business side, editor and, and production is you know, what it, what, what the, the, uh, the tone, the voice of the publication and, and the aesthetics and what it looks at. And we're, uh, we're just driving revenue. Who's, uh, who's more powerful, the editor or the publisher, or it's not even comparable? No, that's a very good question too. Um, if you're talking about a, a multi-million circulation, uh, you know, architectural digest, Marie Claire, you know, um, any one of the big name publications that you're familiar with, uh, it's usually the editor. And the editor uh, 
is in a position where they're the the voice and the face of the publication. Uh, what 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 it what it is, what it looks like, how successful it is in terms of readership, is all in the hands of the of, of the editor. Um, and so, in that case, it's we make the magazine. It's beautiful. It's successful. It's one of the best. Go sell some ads. If you're at a smaller mid level, many times the publisher is actually the owner. Mm. Um, then the roles kind of flip. You know, the publisher is the most important thing to drive revenue. You know, if you think of yourself as an investor in a magazine, you expect the editor to be good. You expect the design to be good. And you're, all of your time is spent talking to the publisher saying, how the numbers look? How are we doing? We making money? We selling? So in answer to the question, sometimes it's the publisher. Sometimes it's the, uh, it's the editor-in-chief. And sometimes the owner who launches a magazine is the publisher and editor-in-chief. Chief. And editor in chief. So if you want to go to a trade show, uh, you want to go to an event, everyone wants the editor to show up. Uh, they get all the, the, the great invitations. Publishers have to work for an invitation because they know you're probably going to go there and try to drive business for yourself. Mm. But the editor is going to go there because the editor is going to find information to write about. <laughs> so it's an interesting, it's a fascinating business. It really is to understand it. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate that. Sure. Great, uh, great response. So, so Rick, just want to step back. You talked about Napoleon Hill for a little bit and uh, Think and Grow Rich book, how it played a significant part in your life. Can you um, describe that event in detail a little bit more when you read it, you know, how old you were, um, yeah. exactly how that, that played in and um, any, any thoughts on that as well? So I came to the realization that I was, I, 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 I took a moment at an early age and I was always able to do this as a kid, you know, just sort of, um, put some pretty deep thought at the time, all things considered into who I was, who I hang around with, who I associate with. I hung around some, some not so um, great role models as a kid, some kids that were in trouble. And um, somehow I, I, I managed to navigate through that and, 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 and be, be aware of my surroundings and make a decision that maybe that wasn't the best crowd for me. They're getting in a lot of trouble. Some of them are in jail. What, what am I doing? So it, it was at a point in my life where, what, what am I doing? Who am I? I, I don't want to be a mover in an antique deal in my life. So I thought, well, I better start figuring that out. So I, I turned to a book and Think and Grow Rich was one of the first books I read. And it was just very inspiring. And so that particular part, I have the first couple of chapters about Edwin Barnes that decided to go work for Edison and commit five years I think he's, if I remember correctly, he said, he doesn't know it yet, being Edison, but I'm going to spend a significant time working for him, even if it meant no money. So when I applied for a job, I looked at that and said, well, this is sort of, you know, take the steps, uh, make a commitment and make it happen. I didn't know about the part where I'd have to give up and work for free. Naturally, I went in saying, what do you pay? And when he came back and said, Rick, you know, I seem like a nice guy, but I got to be honest with you. There's really no reason with all of the applicants with sales experience, why I would hire you. You're, you're a mover. Are you not? And I told him, I said, yes, I'm a mover, but here's the important part. I go in and price out a job. None of the things that I do when I move, in other words, I don't lift a coffee table and say, see this, this is what we'll do when we move. None of those things. I didn't even bring my truck. They believed in me that I could move based on all of the things that I would bring into the conversation, my past history, some of the other successful clients, um, why, why hiring me is better than the big movers. You got to hire some of the big movers and the people that actually do the moving are nowhere near as, 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 as experienced in moving because I did it for my dad's antique. Do you want an antique dealer moving you personally, or do you want somebody they just picked up, you know, a couple of weeks ago and gave him 10 bucks an hour? Well, I convinced them. And so uh, when I was being interviewed, I told that story. This is how I sell. And I said, if I, if, 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 if I were to work here for two weeks, and I know you have the slot open because you wouldn't have a job uh, posted. If I sat at that desk, you wouldn't have to pay me and contribute it at the end of two weeks. Isn't that more beneficial than having me walk out the door? And he said, you know, I just told you that you weren't a salesperson, you're not a closer, but you actually just closed me. <laughs> when can you start? 
And I said, I'll start tomorrow if you want. And he said, yeah. So I had sold everything from the moving business, my trucks, my, my equipment. Uh, I sold antiques. I was ready. I was ready to start a career without making any money. I had 2,500 bucks saved. How, how could you not be ready with 2,500 bucks in the bank, right? Uh, but, you know, I looked at that and said, listen, I, I have, that's, that's like looking at a, um, you, you know, a, uh, a, 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 what do they call them? Sand clocks, right? You tip up, tip upside down, the grain starts falling. That was my money. And when it ran out and all the sand was gone, I had a choice to make. I had a decision to make. And I had to commit to making money before all my money ran out or at least at the same time, so that I can continue to live. And I lived with another guy who was on a straight commission job after my two weeks, and now I had to make money. And uh, it was, it was, uh, it was, we, we both had no money. I remember one point we, uh, we, we, we didn't want to do, do anything differently. We, we were going to make it happen. We had absolutely no money and nothing in the house. We had, to, we, 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 uh, we had to get creative. We actually made tomato soup out of ketchup. That was dinner. Literally had no money. And so that was a big incentive, you know. Uh, and what they say in straight commission jobs is, you know, you don't sell, you don't eat. I found out what that was like. Uh, we, uh, I, I, I learned how to sell. I had to. So, Did you grow up poor, Rick? Was What was Georgetown like? Was that a poor area? You know, it, 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 uh, if I sh showed you a picture of my backyard, you'd think so. Uh, we always struggled. Uh, always complaining about never having enough money. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, so poor that I, I, you know, I, I didn't have new clothes and, you know, I, uh, we didn't, uh, uh, you know, have, have enough food on the table, but uh, it was um, for all intent and purpose. Yeah. It was uh, not a lot of money around. I, I didn't get on a plane till I was 18. And I think I left new England, my, my, uh, my entire, uh, you know, up to 18, 20 years old. So we, uh, you know, we were that uh, sort of country family that would go in a camper to go camping. That was our holiday. And uh, always, you know, hearing don't have enough money for that. Um, I, uh, I wanted a mini bike. So I had to uh, negotiate with somebody that uh, his mini bike didn't work. So he, he said, I'd sell it for 50 bucks. And an hour or two later, I had it up and running. And, you know, everything it, it's, it's, again, part of, you know, how to uh, use your experiences in a different way uh, and, and make those connections to, um, you know I, know, I know, I know what it's like for my family to struggle. I know what I had to do in order to do things. How do you apply to today what you have, even if it's a, you know, dealing with multimillionaires in a, in a luxury publishing business, right? You make, you make those associations and those connections and say, listen, this is easy. Look what I used to do. And Rick, going back to thinking grow rich. Um, so growing up relatively poor, you know, close to Boston, one of the largest cities in the country, just just curious. Like I grew up in Philadelphia, um, not too far from you, also one of the largest cities. Yeah. I never heard of the book Thinking Grow Rich, and probably until uh many years, even after college. Mm -hmm. Who who is that person? There had to be somebody or a group. Like, where did you even hear about that book? I I, th I think I went on a journey and 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 probably uh, and nobody I knew heard of it and I never heard of it but but it, but it was uh, and I can't even remember the story of how I found out about it other than I was on a mission to figure myself out I needed I I, I ever, all my friends were going to college and so what was my supplement what was I doing uh, in, in with this feeling of everyone's going to graduate, they're going to get great jobs, and what am I going to do? So I felt I felt a little pressure to uh, to uh, you know um, be be on par with them to do something. So I can't remember how I discovered it because it wasn't on the internet then. Yeah, exactly. But that's I was, how I found it. I found it through I think Amazon. <laughs> yeah, no, it was probably a bookstore. So I would go yeah. to a bookstore, and I just I just uh, I couldn't get enough. I just I have bookshelves full of books that I read at the time. And, you know, I, I think that's, you know, that, that, that's one of the, the biggest reasons that I eventually stayed with it 
and and got successful. So I had a combination of mindset type books at the time we called it attitude mm. and actual sales, like, you know, how to be a good salesperson, you know? So the combination of learning how to sell and then having a book about mindset, not giving up and you can accomplish your dreams together. Those two things kept me going because I didn't have any support for anyone else. I got a job there. My father said, great. What are they paying you? I told him the story. He said, are you crazy? What are you doing? Uh, no support from friends. They thought I was crazy. And then when I had some great stories to tell, I didn't want to hear it. You know, I didn't get, I didn't, I didn't really have um, the, we, there's a lot of talk now about having, um, uh, you know, your relations are uh, a big part of your success. Who do you hang around with? Who do you associate with? Are they lifting you up or pulling you down? And, uh, you know, so it was, so, so it was, it was a difficult time where I had all of these close friends and I sort of drifted away because I, I was uh, telling them stories about, um, you know, uh, talking to uh, Evil Knievel. You know, I sold Evil Knievel uh, an ad, you know. Okay, Rick. Yeah, another great story. Okay, big shot, you know. So, uh, you know, I found myself sort of kind of reintegrating and finding uh, different people to associate with. I felt that was important. Uh, I didn't make that decision all by myself. They get tired of me. <laughs> <laughs> i know exactly what you're talking about all i want to do is share you can't believe it <laughs> what did i do and then you know i caught a couple of them rolling their eyes okay great we, look we, we just can we talk about something else i was like this is the most amazing thing i mean i was a kid i'd uh, put a bunch of pads on and try to do to, to do bike jumps in my yard I, evil can evil was i, I love the guy I idolized him here i'm on the phone some 10 years later and i'm convincing him to sell you know his uh he had he always had these fantastic trailers that he would bring along uh where he would live where he was you know uh, bring his motorcycles and uh i'll never forget cold called uh forget cold calling him i uh i would introduce myself hi it's rick settler is the trailer still for sale uh, yes it is and i'd say uh, my name is rick again who am i speaking with and he said evil <laughs> who answers that question and comes up with the name evil well there's only one guy and the way he said it with his raspy voice it was none other than evil can evil so you know uh you 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 don't say evil who there is no other evil so uh you know that was you know the classic example of a challenge i mean this guy you could talk and talk and talk and ask him a question he just decided not to answer you i'm not gonna play this game so you have to understand all these different personality types. There's a multimillionaire that's very well educated. Uh, maybe it's a plastic surgeon. Then you got evil can evil, and you've got you know one of the uh, uh, you know Jackson brothers that have a car for sale. He wants to talk to you all day long about his car, what it's worth. So it's just it it, it was fascinating trying to bounce from one type of personality to another and try to understand them and get, 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 get to have a dialogue and continue the conversation, build trust and, and, and sell them and get their credit card. That was the ultimate goal. This, this is a great conversation, Rick. Thank you so much, Rick. I want to conclude your story though. So we led up to the time of elite, uh, met, working for elite magazine. How long That's did true. you work there for? And then, um, if you can transition us to present. Yeah. So, um, I left Rob report. Uh, they recruited me to go to elite traveler and uh, when I when I was uh, working with them, and I guess the term would be negotiating with them to to work for them, I was in Boston. I had two boys, maybe three boys, uh, you know, one, two, and four years old, five years old. Uh, and uh, it seemed like a fantastic opportunity. So I, I was leaving what I thought many others thought was, was the greatest luxury magazine on the planet. So where was I going to go next? So Lee Traveler um, distribution uh, for Rob Report was $65 subscriptions, $700 lifetime subscriptions. You buy it on the newsstand, but it was, you know, twice the cost of any other book. And we kept the price high to qualify the person that was going to buy it. Um, so we had a very good demographic, uh, uh, household income, net worth. All those numbers were very high. And, and a lot of successful people advertising uh, in the magazine claiming that, yeah, we do reach the people you claim. I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I want to be in every issue. It, it works really well. So, uh, when I, when I went to elite traveler and I learned that their distribution was going to be onboard private jets, I thought, well, that 
is a and only available. No newsstand, no subscription. Although, although eventually we did offer subscriptions, but you have a person that flies a private jet. The demographic is 10x what Rob Report was, uh, simply because it was made public. So um, my deal was that I would move to New York permanently. I would be two weeks there, a week traveling, and a week home uh, after a year. And, you know, we'll test each other out, make sure it works, and then move your family over here. Um, and after our first issue, which was uh, wildly successful, never thought we could get the numbers. We did it, though. 9-11 uh, happened. And fortunately, I was home. I wasn't in the office. My assistant was calling, crying. What do I do? Are they going to bomb us next? And I began to realize, well, I did this until I prove to myself and others that I could launch a magazine, somebody else's money, but it's the best way to launch a magazine somebody else is paying for. Um, and so I just, just, just decided I got three boys, really a strain on my marriage, um, traveled extensively um, after the first issue. And after 9-11, no one picked up the phone to buy an ad in a magazine going on private jets. I knew it was temporary, but for the next couple of months, I said, you know what? my time to step away put it together we got the team together we launched a very successful magazine i feel good i feel bad because i didn't want to quit anything but i feel good you you're in a good place and uh and so i started my uh my company we rick, rick i just want to pause it real quick how 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 long did you work at elite for uh six months oh wow so you were only there six months and you did all that you well, you know, part of part of launching a magazine is, um, especially where a publisher wasn't necessarily in that line of work. They did travel publications and other kind of magazines. But um, um, how do you how do you uh, present to somebody before you even have a magazine that they should advertise in the first edition? Right. So I surrounded myself with a lot of people in New York City uh, as salespeople that were very well connected. And uh, I used myself and I used uh, the um, uh, the successful uh, CEO who's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, who was a, a very uh, active consumer. Uh, and we sort of looked for everything we possibly could look for to bring the story to somebody to say, this is going to be a big hit. and You should jump on and jump on early. Um, design, uh, I didn't agree with when it came out. The person who designed it, we had to level up. We actually... Um, uh, told the CEO, no, can't use this guy. And uh, he had a 164 foot yacht that was in Miami at the time. So when he flew out there, he asked his captain to go investigate designers. And he, he uh, found a, a great design team and they came back and for a significant amount of money, redesigned the whole publication. And it started to have the look and feel of what advertisers that we were going after would, would like to uh, participate in. Um, Work to get the editor uh, that had a, a strong voice and a good reputation in the travel industry. Uh, and uh, she knew had a lot of contacts. So uh, through a, a number of contacts that existed, uh, people that knew what we were capable of, uh, capable of uh, knew what we had done in the past. Um, we made the first issue very, very successful. And, uh, and the second issue always takes a little bit of a dip and then it picks back up again because you use your whole Rolodex on the first one. Um, but yeah, today it's a, it's a very successful uh, uh, publication. And in, in my uh, Lux Communications media buying company, we buy a lot of ads in Rob Report, a lot of ads in, in, uh, in uh, Elite Traveler. So it's, it's, it's crazy because although I worked the, in, in both, and I, and I think something only so far my kids are impressed by, uh, I was the publisher of Rob Report and Elite Traveler, and so far nobody's ever uh, repeated that. Wow. Uh, there's nothing better than having your kids say, think dad's great, right? Dad's cool, right? It's just <laughs> the greatest feeling in the world. I don't care what anyone thinks about me. My son, you know, thinks I'm cool. That's the best. Um, he saw who was, uh, who's the young pop star? Uh, can't think of his name. Uh, started out 12, 14 years old, a sensation. Anyway, the name will come to me, but he had a post on Instagram where he's in front of his showcase with watches and his jewelry. And on one side was Rob Report and on one side was Elite Traveler in his showcase. My Justin son Bieber? 
Yes, Justin Bieber. My son saw that and said, Dad, are these the magazines you work for? Well, he thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Uh, yeah, so he, Justin. He actually read, he, him and Will Smith, uh, Sharon Lecter told me the story. They they are uh, big fans of of um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. <laughs> so they oh, read yeah. that. <laughs> well. Um, From what I hear. Will Smith uh, was looking at investing in a company that had advertised at Robbery, in Rob Report for a number of years. It was a conversion company, still very active, still doing a great job for a lot of celebrities in Hollywood. And he takes a, uh, a Mercedes van, and he turns it into a rolling office or whatever it is that you want to build in the back. Uh, probably adds $125,000 on top of the purchase of the vehicle. So they're you know not for everyone. So he was doing cars for Will Smith and and he said, you know, hey, listen, I I uh, I get all my business from Robbery Puts, the only place I advertise. So Will said, that is such a cool magazine. And he said, well, I know the guys. Next time you're here, if you want to meet him. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it turned into a, uh, can you guys come out here and meet Will? He wants to meet you. <laughs> so we had just negotiated for a, a private, fractional private jet company from NetJets. And the deal is if you if you rent a jet, or a part of your, your program, you get a certain size jet. They can go up and provide a bigger jet for when you want it, but they can never go down. So at the time, we had an eight-passenger jet, and it was a long flight to L.A. from Boston. So we uh, we got Harrison Ford's jet that he had just turned in and bought another one. So we flew in Harrison Ford's jet to go see Will Smith when he was filming a movie on set, and then had lunch with him and spent the afternoon with him. Uh, just amazing you know it, 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 i just told the story of how i grew up so here i am flying and the whole time i'm flying i'm going is this is this for real am i gonna wake up i hope i don't wake up and this all goes away uh but uh yeah that was uh that 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 was definitely you know one of many kind of cool stories with um with the uh, rob report and uh and elite traveler was really no different so after elite traveler after six months um i had worked for a company for 17 years I gained all my experience, hopefully some credibility. I went to Elite Traveler to test it. It worked out. We crushed it. So I started a business and it started out uh, as almost sort of a rep firm where we would take everything was was becoming uh, remote and fractional and you could hire an editor that didn't have to be in the office and creative people and so forth. Um, and people would start a magazine and, and, and I always thought this was the wrong approach. The editor and the creative director would get together, conceptualize, they'd put a magazine together, they'd share it with their friends, and they'd say, you know what, you're a genius. This is brilliant. What a great idea. And then they said, and then we'll go get some salespeople that can sell it. Well, you need to integrate the salespeople in the beginning. The salespeople have to, have, have to be part of that conversation. If we build this, if this is what we write about, here's what it looks like. Can you sell it? And they have to say yes. And the biggest mistake people make is they think because it looks beautiful, people will buy it. You have to integrate the salespeople. So we became that sales group, whether it's a consultant or whether they hired us full time. We began to go to the business of presenting ourselves as an available sales team with luxury experience. Um, <clears throat> most of the publications had uh, regional uh, directors and they had people that um, were already in place. We wanted to take over the whole magazine. So we found ourselves in a niche of going to custom publications by luxury um, companies that wanted to put out their own magazine. Four Seasons has their own magazine. Ritz Carlton has their own magazine. Um, and all the car companies had their own magazine. So we started with Jaguar. We called them up and we said, this is what we do. And we can help fill the pages of Jaguar magazine with luxury advertising. And they said, brilliant. Uh, you know, it's from the UK, right? Brilliant. Uh, we, uh, we're looking for somebody. We're looking for somebody in the U S to help us. That was a horrible impersonation. Sorry, Rick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Give me a minute. It gets better. Uh, brilliant. So, uh, so we, uh, we contacted, uh, the folks in, uh, in the UK about Jaguar magazine. I think within 24, 48 hours, if you are who you say you are, and we want to meet you, uh, we want to engage. So we, uh, we went to a meeting and, uh, uh, yeah, we we had an office. We called it the chicken coop when we first started. It was all wire and something somebody had. You know, we traded some some sales expertise for a publishing and uh, pre press company. We could use the the office, and we asked to borrow his uh, conference room for this meeting. And uh, we we uh, we had a very good meeting. We 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 convinced them we could <clears throat> do a good job. And we became the the U.S. 
exclusive authorized Salesforce for Jaguar. And we moved into all of the other publications and we became known, we got referrals that we were the sales team that could bring you through your custom publishing project revenue to offset the cost of the publication. So if a publication costs $300,000 to produce and we sold $200,000, you imagine how valuable that is. It either goes back to the publisher or it's shared with the client. So Jaguar might find out that rather than paying three hundred dollars, three hundred thousand dollars for that for, for that uh, particular issue, uh, their net check to the publisher may be reduced down to uh, just a hundred thousand dollars because of the sales efforts. So they came to the U.S. and after a while, uh, we filled uh, every page in the magazine. We uh, doubled or tripled the rates. Uh, we went to uh, Laguna Niguel, California, uh, stayed at an oceanfront hotel, uh, had some really good uh, food every night. Uh, the corporate headquarters was out there. And um, but at that point, sort of began to feel like, well, this is what I thought it would be like if I started my own company, but didn't want to lose all of the, uh, the you know, the the the. Uh, publisher kind of of uh, benefits I had while working for the other books. It was starting to come together. So we went from Jaguar to all the other publications. And um, just recently we did uh, Bugatti. It was our biggest challenge, only it was easier than we thought. They wanted $25,000 a page. We established that right. And they only had 2,300 people getting the magazine. So that CPM was like $1,000 a hundred. And most cost per thousand books are seventy-five to one hundred fifty dollars per thousand. Uh, it was unheard of, but everyone lined up. I think we sold out in a week or two. And uh, we, what we had was something that nobody else could could offer them. We had every single person <clears throat> who bought a who bought a Bugatti receive a magazine in a box. It was a hundred anniversary. It was. Uh, it was the most magnificent magazine, oversized book you've ever seen. Had to be impressive for Bugatti owners. And every in 90, I think that the, the stat is 98.9% .9 of all Bugatti owners are billionaires around the world. So 2,300, small number, smaller the slice, the higher the price. We had a specialty, uh, you know, a business of reaching high net worth people. And, uh, but you're reaching 2,300 billionaires in a magazine that you know, as passionate as they are with that car, they're going to flip through every single page and associate the brand with the products that are in there. So that was, that was, uh, that was a terrific, uh, uh, you know, arrangement with, uh, with Bugatti. So we, we became known from our first call to Jaguar uh, as the company that could bring revenue into custom publications. So we do it for Ritz Carlin, we do it for Four Seasons, all the car books, several other books. Uh, yachting publications and that sort of thing. So that's 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 current day. That's what that's what, that's what we do. We we have owned and operated publications, and we have an agency where we consult and and buy media for clients. So uh, the business that you do with um, like Bugatti, Bugatti and and uh, Jaguar, et cetera, that's a different animal. That's a different entity than like the the luxury uh, magazines that you have on the yeah. other side. It's two yeah. different things, right? It's just, it's a, it's the parent company's RMS Media Group. Lux Communications falls under that parent company. That's a separate division. Um, and the other publications are owned and operated, which we build in-house. Yeah. So yeah. the bulk of your, your revenue streams probably coming from Lux Media, the, the th doing the things you just talked about, right? With Bugatti, et cetera. Um, that is a very big growing uh part of it it's not it's 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 probably uh 50 percent oh, okay um but you know we, we we also have some uh some big clients uh you know gulfstream jet um we have a number of uh luxury brands that most people are probably not familiar with but they're you know um uh you know kalamazoo is a grill manufacturer they're they're grills that you could go down to home depot and think you're buying a grill that's equivalent same size having no no information and knowledge about how well built this other grill is you're looking at it same size the burn is the width uh is a thousand ninety nine dollars and there starts at twenty five thousand dollars <laughs> so 
you know, I know some sort of pretty wealthy friends that uh, that I like in my circle, and uh, it's twenty five thousand. Are you crazy? You know, so think about kind of um, position in 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 life and the kind of uh, home and kind of money, discretionary money you have to have. You don't need. That's the thing about luxury. Somebody asked me, "What's luxury?" It's buying something you want, but you don't actually need to have that particular product. You can find one less money. Uh, you want a functioning grill. It's not necessarily luxury. You can buy one. It's a thousand bucks, 500 bucks. You want a $26,000 grill. You have the luxury of having the money to buy a luxury grill with things that you don't necessarily need. It does. It cooks steaks, but most people, when they entertain, they like to be, you know, like to have conversation pieces around where they are, whether it's artwork, whether it's grills, whether it's, you know, cars, so you have to, you know, that you have to understand that. And, and, and with customers, you know, how do I fit in finding that person that is that, um, you know, collection of interesting things? How do I find more of those people so I can invite Kalamazoo Grill into that? So I can invite, you know, a, um, a kitchen company that, uh, you know, if you don't have 500,000 for a kitchen, not the right audience. Um, watches. Um, I was at a watch show when I was holding a suitcase, which the salesperson had a handcuff that was wrapped around his wrist to hold the suitcase when he traveled because it was uh it was three and a half million dollars worth of watches three watches in there wow. and he would uh be charged with transporting that because they're not going to put it in fedex so he would he would move the suitcase to private collections uh to private collectors you can't hide that though right if you're around a bunch of thieves they see something handcuffed to your hands they're <laughs> it's going to yeah. draw a lot more attention to you i would think it, you know, that's what I thought too. And I asked him that. He said, well, you know, the, 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 um, they know what they'd have to do in order to get it from me. And they probably know something valuable in there, but to not have it handcuffed, um, it's partly a deterrent and it's partly my boss doesn't trust me enough with it. So he locks it to my wrist. Mm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate that. All right, Rick. So by the way, do you have any, like, and what you do, is there anyone who really competes with you? And, and if so, how, how small, uh, what, what's the, how many competitors are there out there? It seems like you're one of the few, if any, that's really doing what you're doing right now. Well, you know, uh, I, think there, I, I, I think there are, the, there are other people that do what we do and, and they, they come from probably a different background. So, um, the the people that I do know that are in this space, and we do, as you know, different things with Lux Communication from owning our own publication, but um, uh, somebody may have uh, been very successful in, uh, you know, some some aspect of media buying, but it wasn't luxury. So they have that experience, they learn about luxury and combine during the time that they started their business, they, they have a, a lot of value to bring. So there are those people, but... Um, I think where we bring the most value is myself and my, my business partner have had uh, decades of experience, 20 years with just our book, uh, rather our company. And he worked for me at, at Rob Report uh, for a number of years. And uh, he had, um, he broke two uh, records uh, in sales when he was at Rob Report. Uh, one was, he sold the least amount of sales and still managed to keep his job. That was a record. <laughs> sold $150. And I talked to him. I said, listen, kid, I really like you, but you, uh, you got to sell a lot more than that. I mean, significantly more than that in the next issue. So what should I do? I, I don't want to leave. I don't want to get fired. I, I, I just, I just love this. So I, I gave him, gave him some tips and uh, some, some months later, maybe it was a year later, the average salesperson's monthly gross sales was in 40 to $60,000 range. He sold $421,000 in a month. The same guy that broke the record for the least amount of sales anyone ever sold and still kept their job he sold the student. most sales. Yeah. Wow. So that's when I said, you know, maybe, maybe I'm pretty good at this. Right? <laughs> But it takes, you know what it is? It, it, it's if, 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 you know, I, I sort of go back to, um, you know, the Karate Kid where Mr. Miyagi, he doesn't take any student. He doesn't want to work with you. You have to have what it takes. 
I'm wasting my time if I try to help you. If you won't do what I tell you to do, what I know will be helpful and stick to it. Mm -hmm. So you gotta be coachable. You sure. gotta be coachable. You gotta be willing to do it. And 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 many times it's uh it's 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 the most it's not just hey, spend 20, 15, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes at home and you know, you know, read a book. It's 24 hours. I don't care what it takes. If you want to do this and if you're sincere, here's what you have to do. And so so we we were paying out 20% commission uh to salespeople at the time. So what's that math, Dr. Finance? 420,000 at 20%. That's a lot of money. That's 80,000. It's over $80,000 he made on that one month. Yeah. And that was that was 25 years 90, ago. 90,000, you said 450, right? Yeah. Yeah, that was 25 years ago. So this guy was an absolute legend. And uh, you know, but anyway, yeah, it was uh well, he made over a million dollars that year, not bad, right? Just no, getting into the business. He didn't do that. He didn't do that every month, but okay. but boy, he made a lot of money. Uh yeah. And you know what? He he made for a a, a great uh, signpost out front in terms of uh <laughs> advertising and promoting to salespeople right. what kind of money they can make. Before and after. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. It's been, it's been great uh, hearing your story and, and really bringing it to present. We're, we're, we got a few more questions um, that we're going to ask and they're all going to tie in at some point as well. So, right. Um, all right. So Rick, I don't know, have you wrote any books? I usually ask this to, I've had a lot of number one New York times bestsellers on here. Mark Victor Hansen broke the record for that. He was on yeah. here, for example. Um, do you have any books though? Uh, I'll just pose that question just in case. I don't know if you do, but. I do not. I, I think there's there's one or two in the future. I've got a, a lot of stories I'd love to reduce uh, okay. to writing and uh, and get it out there. But no. And by the way, you just reminded me, I'm pleased to be among those that you've had on as guests. Uh, I, you know, I saw your uh, your uh, list of, of people and watched quite a few uh, episodes and uh, uh, very impressive. And it's nice to be among them. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate you, man. All right, Rick. So next question then. I know books really wasn't your thing, but magazines was, and you, you know, you're in the publishing business. So can you give us a quick summary of your magazines? You already mentioned them before, maybe a minute or two, just like real, real quick. I think you said you had five, was it five magazines? Yeah. Three different divisions. Um, yeah. A quick rundown. So, so North shore magazine, um, if you're familiar at all with the area, it's, it's sort of North of Boston, uh, New Hampshire border and all along the coast. And you have communities like Newburyport, which is the birthplace of the United States Coast Guard. You have Marblehead, which is the sailing capital. You know, I don't know if it's the sailing capital of the world, but it's certainly um, uh, the East Coast version. Um, and a lot of significant history and, uh, you know, cottages that are 8,000, 10, 12,000 square feet from uh, folks 100, 200 years ago that live, uh, worked in Boston that wanted to go to Manchester by the sea and live on the coast, you know. So, it, to me, looking at what do I want to start? What do I want to create? What have I done in the past? I looked at it as a uh, ripe opportunity for a publication that didn't exist necessarily in the town. Everyone um, leaned on Boston Magazine. And every now and then some scraps of information about the North Shore were shared, but it focused on Boston. So it's a, there's a place for North Shore Magazine. So 20 years, we actually bought it. It, it was a um, 32 page staple bond magazine. We bought it and developed it. And I took the the beauty and the, and the quality and the photography and the writing and turned a magazine, a uh, local magazine into something that everyone thought was national, right? And just, just really pumped up the quality. Uh, because of that, uh, photographers were attracted to it. Your magazine papers among the best I've ever, my, my, my work would look beautiful on those pages. Writers wanted to have, uh, uh, be involved with us. So that, that's, that's been a good run of, of almost 20 years with, uh, with North Shore magazine. We started North Shore home and we really uh, do a lot for the community and a lot of community, uh, interest in us because we help tell stories of some of the businesses and really help to promote businesses and many credit their success to being involved with us. So that's a feel good. Um, Luxury Pools and Outdoor Living is a magazine that we bought and it is for the top, as you might imagine, might guess, the top pool builders uh, and all of the accessories and uh, hardscape and architecture uh, really sort of starting at four or $500,000 pool, 
and backyard. If you don't have four or 500,000, you probably wouldn't want to be contacting the people that advertise and show off their work there. So all of the celebrities, all of the most fantastic pools you've ever seen and, and ultimate backyards, probably the ones that are involved with, uh, with luxury pools. So it, it really exists as a lookbook, as a presentation of all kinds of ideas for your backyard. Uh, so people, uh, we actually had somebody from the UK that said, well, I want to buy you back issues. If I read one issue um, and, I, and I finish it, it's just not going to be enough. So send, send me your, your, your back issues. How much, just, just put them in a box. He said, you know, it's about 20 years old, right? So there's going to be a lot of them. Yeah, I don't care. I, I want to look at them. So $897 later, we wrapped up all the magazines and shipped them to the UK. Um, people with uh, two, three, four homes want a fantastic uh, backyard. And uh, we present all of these actual backyards, photographs, listing the builder, describing what the process was like. So it's a lead source for somebody that can actually do the projects as opposed to just looking at a photograph online. Uh, you can get a contact uh, uh, and, and have a conversation with somebody and say, I, I want that pool. I've looked at a number of them. Can you build me one just like the one on page 22? So that works really well in the pool business. And we're the only uh, business to consumer pool publication. And so we're sort of the architectural digest minimized in the pool business. Um, and then we have Ocean Home, which is, uh, you know, we were talking earlier uh, about uh, how can there be an explosion of magazines each year? Where do they go? Isn't there already enough magazines? So if you take a look at the early days, there was Ski Magazine, maybe it was one magazine. And then there was uh, a variation of Ski Magazine. And then there's, uh, you know, uh, there's Cross Country Ski Magazine. And then there's Snowboard Magazine. And then there's East Coast. This. So you can have multiple, you know, slices of a subject matter being more specific as you go motorcycle magazine, dirt bike magazine, you know, uh, uh, Harley Davidson magazines, Japanese magazine, my, motorcycles, expensive ones, cheap ones. So um, the real estate market was divided up. Uh, I did some research and I realized that, you know, you take a magazine like Unique, Unique Homes, been around for a long time, at, at its peak was 450 pages, but you're looking for an ocean home. You, you go into looking for a home, usually deciding, a, a, a lot of different things about the home you want to buy. What's the region? What's the type? Is it an equestrian property? Is it an ocean front? Is it a lake front? By the time you look at just the properties you want to see, maybe it's down to 20 properties in a 450 page magazine. So we wanted to create ocean home featuring homes for sale from the top real estate brokers around the world. We want to have conversations about, um, you know, some of the things that uh, you face as a homeowner, you know, uh, hurricane shutters, you know, special glass to protect you, um, security systems, assuming it's your second and third home, um, and all kinds of design and decor ideas. So if you're an Ocean Home person, you're going to want Ocean Home Magazine. And it's been successful for about 15 years and a lot of uh, consistent advertisers and uh, a lot of people love it. A lot of people call us uh, certain celebrities and very successful people. How, how do I get my home featured on this? That, that that's that's when you know you've sort of made it at some level when somebody wants to be you know involved in your magazine and, and it's an impressive person so rick that's three three total magazines right well north shore has a division within itself with north shore homes so that's just featuring uh homes so yes four four different products with 22 deadlines a year <laughs> so 20 20 22 editions a year wow so, so Rick, if you put it all together, the major theme is luxury. Yes. Right? So yes. when you when you started on this this track after nine one one, and you're like, all right, I'm opening up my own business, and you started creating these magazines. Your whole thing was every in your head, your mind was the purpose would be somehow connected to luxury, yes. finding niches here and there, off uh, ocean homes and pools, but then they all have to be part of your aggregate brand purpose really yeah. which is luxury yes right right yeah that's brilliant and so this then you're is, in it from different angles too yeah yeah um and it, it slices the luxury so when you when you're talking about um somebody that's a potential customer you could talk about pool builders and the kind of customers they're looking for you could be in uh you know uh, an automobile publication 
the theme is that you understand uh, the mindset um, and uh, uh, the 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 uh, the buyer and how they make purchasing decisions. It doesn't matter what the product is; they're mostly the same. Folks, Off- I, I want to step out, step out for a second. So we're interviewing Rick. I want you to understand what Rick's path has been. He's he's been involved with luxury publications for a long time, but behind that scenes. He's been working with some of the, the richest people on the planet. So what we're, what we're going to learn today as we, as we continue this, this interview is to really tap into the mindset of a very wealthy person. And if you do that, you can understand a lot of things about how to manage your own personal wealth, because you, usually, not always, okay, there are many examples of wealthy people that have lost money from doing foolish things like gambling. But ones that continue to, to, to manage their wealth properly, like the ones that were Rick's clients and friends, they are um, ones that you want to learn a lot of information about. And Rick's, Rick's going to show us the industry. So look at the little clues as we continue this interview to figure out how to help build your, your wealth up by maybe modeling some of the activities of the people that we talk about. So th- thank you, Rick, for allowing that interjection. I just wanted to um, you know, speak on that for, for you. Yes. My pleasure. Rick, Rick, next question. We're going to, we're, we're going to get into luxury, but first um, let's talk about the magazine industry for a moment. So can you tell us a little bit about the magazine industry, maybe in a minute or less, just a summation of uh, the industry. Um, you talked about there was 10,000 publications out there. Uh, you know, what, how many, how many magazines exist today? For example, um, just a little bit of uh, data and facts on the magazine industry as a whole. Yeah, I'm not sure that the current number of magazines, that number of 10,000 was actually a number from years ago that were actually launched, right? Thousands of publications launch every year. So uh, there's a, um, a, a rule of thumb with, with, with publications. Um, and it's the, uh, the 10, let's see if I can remember this, the 10 hundred rule. And, and that is that out of a thousand magazines, a hundred make it. And out of those hundred, only 10 make it. So the launch of magazines, given the the survivability, um, the the net net down to how many actually survive is, is is kind of a small increase every year, and and in the past uh, magazines have gone out of business, um, particularly those that um, don't necessarily appeal any longer once you know digital formats and social media and other channels became available. So for example, let's say PC World. Who, who buys PC World? People that are interested in technology, right? More likely that those people are so involved and engaged in technology that they're less, less likely to be picking up a print magazine. Their whole world's in front of a computer. So they, make a good, they may go to a digital edition. They make a lot of business, right? And then you have a magazine that, that, that potentially follows somebody that is, um, is and has always been a magazine reader. And some people have transitioned and some people in, in, in years ago, wealth was more, you know, 55 plus today, it, it skews a little bit younger. There's a lot of, you know, uh, very, very, very uh, wealthy, uh, rich, younger uh, demographic. But, uh, you know, a yachting publication, uh, I just picked one up the other day, I, was, I think it was 350 pages. The yachting community tends to skew older and the demographics and the lifestyle uh, lends itself to uh, print publications, particularly the beauty of how you can present the editorial and the destinations and the various pages of a beautifully designed yacht. That's a good example of one that's thriving. So, you know, the printing public, the printing business um, is, is, well, we're making money. And other people are making money. So money is to be made. It's not like everyone's doing poorly. Uh, but there are some that probably shouldn't be out publishing print magazines and, and that they, they're going to fall by the wayside. Um, um, but print publications surround themselves with other things where they didn't 20 years ago, like social media, uh, like uh, email lists, uh, events and shows and that sort of thing. Uh, so if you add that to your print publication, you can have a thriving business. Um, so the uh, the publishing business as a whole, uh, it's getting be beaten up by digital purchasing. 
And so I believe that's a temporary phase. Um, Sim- and, so sorry to interrupt you, Rick. Similar yeah. to the book industry, like when when yeah. you were able to to make your own book independently by yourself by hiring yeah. Create Space, yeah. one of these other big companies, right? Like that changed the whole nature of the publication business in the past fifteen years. I would say, um, like their 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 whole industry has been reduced to a, to a, a very very small size. Would you say yeah. that that happened in the magazine industry and and roughly? The same time as well it did but but it's interesting people look at the business as a whole right and uh they say boy your business is tough well um actually you have to look at your own business in, in am i growing or am i am, am i uh shrinking and, and 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 am i in trouble financially because of what's happening well just because a hundred magazines full doesn't mean my business is suffering my business could be thriving because of it. So it's really, you know, by, by industry. And um, you also, uh, years ago, you just, it was simple. You had editorial, you had design, and you sold print ads. And here are the sizes of print you sold. Today, there's three, four, five other uh, uh, channels and revenue streams you, fo- you focus on. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the goal is, I, I remember just telling this to my team, the company said, we need to change in the face of changing conditions. Uh, we need to adopt to what's going on, embrace it. It's not competition. We used to think social media was competition. They're going to crush us. Well, we build our own social media, and now somebody can engage in our social media that is interesting for them to be involved in. So we actually sell social media placements today, right? So rather than looking at it like it's going to deteriorate our business, it's amplifying it. So um, Luxury Pools Magazine uh, Instagram page has 45,000 followers. It's never going to be in the millions because we're really, you know, top 1%. We want to reach, um, you know, people that can afford a $400,000 pool. Well, how many well, people do you Rick, think? I'm, like I'm sorry, pause real quick. So you, you said that you sell placements on like Instagram. So if someone wanted to yeah. buy an advertisement, you can put it on your Instagram page for, let's say, Ocean Homes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you sell that post. Well, we can we can guide people and send in, in, in uh, sponsored uh uh, Facebook posts, for example, right? You've seen as you scroll down your feed, you see sponsored and you see, yeah. uh, you know, a prom- promotional uh, section. Maybe, maybe it's a video. Um, when you do that, it looks like an advertisement if you're doing it under your name. Mm-hmm. What we offer is doing it under Ocean Home. And when it says Ocean Home, sponsored by, uh, and it's a, an outdoor waterproof TV that pops up in your backyard. Uh, with the ocean in the background, uh, it, it, it appears third-party endorsed by Ocean Home Magazine. It's not like somebody's just promotion, you know, promoting their own, telling their own story under the banner of, "Hey, this is paid. Yeah, we paid for it uh, to to present to you." So, so we realized with the, with our following, and then uh, with uh, with with actually promoting that particular sponsored page, doing look look alike audiences and pulling in our subscribers to help, um, you know, produce uh, specific people that the, the, it will be shown to. Uh, there was value in that to, to other folks, whether that's uh, an integrated campaign with print or that was digital alone. So now what the printing business, uh, the, the publishing business has to offer, if, if people are smart and they stay up with, with changing times and consider, you know, what people are asking for, what are they buying? When they say no to print, well, then what are you buying is important to ask, right? It, it just, the answer is not nothing. Uh, it's it's we're, we're moving it to digital. Well, what kind of digitally doing? So we're involved with getting influencers to grow um, product sales. We're involved with our own products uh, in terms of social media and how we can um, do uh, uh, buys based on either a sponsored post. Uh, we've done uh, Instagram stories on a client. Sometimes it's added value to a much bigger campaign. So really, I don't look at it like it's more complicated now. How many pages, how many quarter pages, half pages, and full pages have we sold? That was the conversation 20 years ago. Today, it's like there's 150 different things you can sell to a customer. But the brand, if it has good, uh, solid uh, engagement within the audience, the brand can develop all kinds of different things. If it doesn't, nothing's going to work. And so that's what we try to achieve. Rick, uh, I had um, Robert G. Allen on here uh, a few episodes ago. Robert G. Allen wrote the book, Multiple Streams of Income. 
Yeah. And uh, I think it was called No Money Down, his first book, one of the top real estate books ever. And his, the multiple streams of income really changed the vernacular of most business uh, books after that point. Basically, yeah. you need to, he's, you know, the, the finance uh, talks about diversification, but that's essentially what he was saying in a greatly marketed way. But what you what you just said was along the same line of thinking that he was trying to say, which is, it's actually a good thing. So now, yeah. you know, now you you don't have two, like before you only had two spots that you could sell, but now you have many different things that you can offer, which yeah. spreads out your risk from a, another future publication yeah. uh, catastrophe where, you know, another internet yeah. or something being born. Right. You, at least you have other things to fall back on if one of them becomes obsolete at that point. That's, so. that's, that's exactly right. You, you need to secure that Instagram content because not only can you find it valuable in the future, if you don't have it, then somebody else can create that one channel and get a, you know, 50,000, 150,000 followers and have their own entity, which competes with you, which you slept on that, you know, that, that placement of, of, of occupying, uh, uh, you know, Instagram. And so the part of it is out of necessity. The other part is it just makes, it just makes a lot of sense um, to, uh, to broaden uh, the base and, and, and have different channels of revenue. No question about it. Thank you, Rick. Great response. Rick, next question about Rob report. Can you give us just like maybe a 30 second debriefing on what it is? Again, I know you mentioned it before, but just maybe a quick summary in 30 seconds or less. Yeah. So it's how the hell stands to in, in terms of luxuries. It's the biggest one out there, et cetera. Yeah. Well, I, I think it, uh, it's been, I, I think it's 45 years old. It started in 1976. Rusty White started it connected with a Rolls Royce dealer and said, what if I got all of your customers of Rolls Royce uh, uh, owners and buyers and prospects? Um, and we offered luxury items, individual items that people had to sell. Wouldn't, wouldn't this be successful? Well, I'll give you the list. Go for it. So we created a, um, a, uh, a three ring binder uh, made out of suede or leather and, and, and sent mimeograph copies. Mimeograph is an old term, but that's what it was. Uh, and you would uh, read the 16 pages mailed to you and then put it in your three ring binder and serve it as a, a collection. Um, so it began to open up. It was just for Rolls Royces. It was just for, uh, you know, the owner's uh, collection of, of antiques he wanted to sell. And it eventually moved to a four color publication and it sold, um, uh, it had a special section in the back photo classified section that had dealers and individuals, yachts, jets, real estate and vintage classic and exotic automobiles. Um, the rest of the book had uh, uh, services that were, that were, that were for sale uh, butler service in the UK. We'll train your butler, send him here to the British butler training school for two weeks and we'll bring him. He'll have the finest butler education in the world. Wow. Um, we, you know, miniaturize uh, miniature horses, uh, you know, uh, small, uh, you know, Ferraris for your kids that exact replica quarter scale, you know, just the most outrageous things you could ever imagine. And this was the place to advertise them. And there, there was, was no, no other thing doing that. Nothing, no other... not even, not even close. No, wow. we were interviewed by the BBC. We were interviewed by, uh, Oprah on the Oprah, uh, uh, show, and uh, we created an ultimate gift guide. It was just the most outrageous things. So people came to actually purchase. People came to dream and people came for inspiration. So people wanted to have that, those items, whether they wanted that lifestyle, they wanted to have those items. So, so it was inspiration. I've heard many times, been there so long that I heard it in the beginning years and later on found out that the person was very, very successful and credits it to Rob Report. So Today, it's a magazine, less, you know, cars from individuals, not at all, actually, and um, more uh, very, very uh, uh, well-known luxury brands that want to use the platform, um, less kind of crazy things, you know, uh, things like the uh, the briefcase telephone was launched at Rob Report, you know, um, uh, conversions to four wheel drive, luxury cars on top of four wheel drive, everything you could possibly think of, you know, sort of started in the pages of Rob Report. People found out that's where, when I create this, that's where I'll find actual buyers. 
Um, so yeah, it's it's a very polished uh, publication today, and it, you know, in my mind, it's beautiful and, and works very well. And people people uh, do 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 read it, continue to read it, uh, subscribe to the newsletters, and doing all the things right to get to the right people, having events. Uh, but those days, you know, people people used to tell us, I would. I would get into my office. I don't care what was on my schedule. When it came into my office, I'd shut the door and I would just page after page. I'd spend hours going through the craziest things I've ever heard of in the magazine. Uh, we had dinosaur eggs, you know, uh, just, just, just crazy things. You know, our biggest challenge sometimes was try to get the fraud out and make sure it was legitimate because we would get complaints from the readers, you know. I bought this from you. I laid down $20,000 for this egg and I found out it was fake. It's a spray paint. It may as well be an Easter egg. You sold me this. You know? uh, so we, uh, you know, I had somebody that uh, owned um, a uh, a business that sold uh, shopping carts at the airport, uh, the uh, airport carts and shopping carts. Imagine having, you know, a monopoly on building shopping carts hugely successful he bought two cars from the magazine that were uh, i would put in the category of uh, too good to be true and uh, one was a ferrari owned by uh, john lennon and the other was a uh, royal family owned uh, rolls royce they were right hand drive first clue right i mean they were left hand drive uh, first clue if they come from the uk they should be right hand drive unusual somebody would ship a left hand drive to the uk um perfect condition, photographed beautifully, and um, numerous calls from the from the uh, advertisement. And uh, they said, listen, I got so many calls here. Listen, Dr. Finance, you want this? I need $250,000. Wired to me now, or I'm just going to the next guy. And this guy bought one of the cars and then found out that the blue boat that was supposed to ship the car two weeks from now never showed up. Wow. So he wanted the money from us. It was because of your publication that I trusted to wire that money. Had it not been with your magazine, I bought a number of things from it. I never would have purchased this. We had to defend ourselves against a lawsuit uh, where somebody blamed us for uh, uh, not checking thoroughly the, 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 the people that advertised. So we, 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 we ended up not losing, but, um, but it, it, it sort of changed the way that we viewed anything and everything from anybody uh, with the advertisements. So again, another learning experience. <laughs> <laughs> that is amazing, Rick. And just to think, you know, 45 years, roughly speaking, that's been around. And you were the publisher, I, I believe you said for 17 years. You yeah. worked there for 17. I mean, you you took uh, 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 probably the uh, bulk of their best times. I mean, you were with you. I mean, how many other publishers were there? Uh, family members. I don't think there was anyone outside. Uh, but... I I happen to believe that uh, knowing what what I knew going into it, um, and knowing uh, the support that I got from other businesses from the entrepreneur that bought it, he passed away six months after I left. Uh, his I would I would guess seven uh, you know twelve businesses that he had worth hundreds of millions of dollars. In a few years, they were all gone. The only thing the family had was Rob Report. So I was under uh, immense pressure to make sure that this last um, uh, company would uh, would not only be successful, but would provide them with uh, a, a net worth that uh, they could go in the future with. So um, yeah, it was it, it was de definitely taking ma a struggling magazine and turning it into a, a worldwide uh, you know recognizable brand uh, with uh, more uh, ad pages. With 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 when I left, uh, size of the book was 350, 400 and something pages. It's never since gotten anywhere close to those numbers. So, yeah, we broke we bro we broke a lot of barriers and, and created a very successful publication that the right people have it now to do a really good job with where it is. But that was definitely an important era. Thanks, Rick. That that's amazing. That's amazing. That puts a lot of things into context. We're going to talk about luxury next. Um, cause I, I also see as a, as a luxury expert, knowing what, you know, uh, from the, from my last book, the survival of the richest, I had a quote in here and I just love to get your opinion on this. So I, I designed a lot of different, um, theories and, and, and statements to build into the arguments that I had in there, uh, which 
beyond the scope of this conversation right here, but one of the quotes that I had was about luxury. And I had to connect survival to finance, to economics, and um, built this big argument. But luxury was a part of that. And, and I was trying to show where it fits in there. And actually, ironically, uh, the, quote, the quote here from that book, luxury has no place in pure survival. Page 146 of The Survival of the Richest, this uh, last book right here. So again, luxury has no place in pure survival. One of my conclusions, I want to hear your thoughts on that. And, and I think you hinted this earlier. People don't, if, if you can define luxury again, and then maybe your thoughts on, the, do, do people really need luxuries to survive? Maybe a minute. Um. <clears throat> the answer they uh, to, to 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 needing luxury, you know, when you when you think of uh, that question as a, uh, a person drowning on the side of a boat, and you have a life ring you throw them. Yeah, you need that life ring. Now, if you relate that to that, to that question, no, no, none none of the things that are luxury do you need because by definition, luxury is several stages about and most up uh, uh, up leveled, uh, and 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 in most if not all cases, something that already exists. Um, you have luxury flooring. Well, you, you could actually stain your, your, your plywood and not have a floor. My dad actually did that in his house. Um, you could have luxury, uh, you know, tissues. It could be five times, uh, you know, uh, as thick and more precious and better paper and everything and, and, and not lead to, to nose, to, to, to nose uh, rashes. That's luxury uh, Kleenex or luxury uh, tissue paper, luxury cars. Nobody needs a $350,000 Bentley to get around. Um, so the, the answer is that uh, no luxury is, is, is definitely not needed, but um, for a lot of people and particularly the, uh, the, the attitude of raw report people, um, luxury, luxury defines success. And certainly during the eighties, right? You you wanted you wanted to find something that um, would. It's not the case today, by the way. The '80s were different, but you wanted to intentionally purchase something where, uh, when you wore it, if, when you rode in it, when you drove up to it, whatever it was, uh, there is no question that cost a lot of money, and you are successful. And 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 that was you know the purpose, right? Um, since then, uh, luxury is, is, is really more about, um, you know, having, uh, experiential, right. It's, 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 uh, uh, it might be a, uh, a curated trip on a private jet somewhere. And each of those destinations of five you went to might be that you met a private chef or, or to, to somewhere in, in the world that, that is, is, is at an impossible to get into restaurant. And after that, you all go skiing, you know, uh, and stay at a private ski club somewhere. And there's a celebrity there, you know, these things that may cost $250,000. So you can say, wow, is that amazing? Um, so people aren't so much as, uh, you know, uh, you know, interested in showing off what they have. In fact, a lot of people buy luxury goods today and they don't buy the uh, obvious things. They may buy a, a suit that no one's ever heard of, but their experience in buying that suit and, and, and getting that suit created, uh, very expensive, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't sport a name that somebody would recognize. And that's sort of what people like. They, they, they want to talk in a small circle of people that know exactly who made that suit. Uh, hey, I considered buying it. What do you think of it? Do you like it? Oh, look at that watch. What kind of watch is that? Uh, you know, uh, a Karl F. Bukhara. What's that? Oh, it's, it's been around for 100 years. Oh, I want to learn more. So people like the luxuries that no one else serves. So they can be in their own little circle talking about these precious things that aren't BMWs and, and, and Rolexes. That's a brilliant, brilliant response. Uh, by the way, Rick, I'm going to send you a copy of my three books. This was a, such an important, coming from someone like you who's an expert and, and spent so much time on the subject. Um, I spent a lot of time building the concept of luxury into uh, a lot of my theories. Yeah. And then only to realize that it was it had to be stripped away because it's really not necessary at all. But you, you see it from a totally different perspective, yet uh, I see that it also blends in and agrees with a lot of the conclusions i have so i appreciate that mm. rick i wanted to um do we need luxuries if you can maybe sum that up 
you, you sort of hinted at that, maybe 10, 20 seconds. So to be clear, do we need luxuries at all? Well, uh, if you look at it from the business standpoint, you know, um, Bernard Anault, I think, is uh, HVMH, LVMH's uh, CEO. Uh, he was one of the richest men in the world. At one point, I think he was. And that's a multi-billion, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, uh, luxury company, right? That's the parent company of a lot of luxury brands that everyone's familiar with. So if you did away with luxury, you're doing away with that company and several others. So there is the financial aspect of doing away with it. But if you're talking about in terms of does anyone really need to buy that item classified as luxury, the answer is no. You don't need to own that. You don't need a 10,000 square foot house. You don't need a $350,000 car. You don't need a garage full of cars. Ralph uh, Lauren bought a uh, Bugatti uh, that is the most expensive car in the world right now. And one of my friends, ironically, uh, I grew up with in, uh, in Georgetown, you know, uh, was the lead restorer on that car. And I watched that car get restored in Ipswich, Massachusetts. Um, and he said, this is going to be, this is Ralph Lauren's car. This is going to be the Concourse de, Elega Concourse de Elegance winner, 100 point restoration. That's what we're going for. We're going to get it. Sure enough, it was. And it is, it's, it's, there are stories of it being worth 40 million. It's probably worth hundreds of millions uh, of dollars, but there's almost no disputing. It's the most expensive car in the world. Do you need that? Well, one could argue that's actually investment. What he restored it for and what it's worth now probably gained a couple of hundred million dollars. Uh, but for the most part, luxury is not looked at as a, as an investment, right? Mm -hmm. However, sometimes if you buy a, a Louis Vuitton uh, $4,500 uh, handbag, it may hold up. You may keep it longer and you may actually sell it when it's done and lose very little money. And if you have it for 20 years because it doesn't go out of style, uh, you may have bought, uh, you know, 10 or 15 purses for $400 and you would have been better off buying it. So is luxury and investment the same thing? I, th I, th I think I think in some cases, you know, you, you can you can find that that might be a tagline. Luxury is an investment. Uh, when I when I left uh, Rob Report, the gift from my salespeople was a, a watch and um, watch was a Panerai and uh, it was about forty five hundred dollars. They all shipped in and bought it. Um, that watch, not just the sale of that, the, you know, the value of that watch and what it would sell for today, but that particular watch is worth ten thousand dollars plus. So when you think of buying something and then twenty years later, it's actually worth twice as much money as what you pay for it. So, so I I wouldn't say that luxury is not an investment, uh, and I wouldn't I wouldn't say all luxury purchases, you know, are incapable of 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 actually in, increasing in value. But when you think of it in terms of the, the, the way that you phrase it, is luxury necessary? No, it's not necessary. But you, you make smart investments in, uh, in uh, fashion, in shirts. I, I bought some, uh, some shirts from a company, Ascot Chang in New York. They lasted 20 years. So yeah, they were three times as much as any other shirt, but I fed shirts that last two years and they start to wear. These things were 15 years old. Um, so in the end, paying a lot more for it, I actually save money. So yes, it can be an investment. Thank you, Rick. Brilliant response. Rick, uh, along the same vein, do owning luxuries make someone financially successful? Was, does that, does, does by having luxuries, um, does that make someone cons considered successful? Um, you know, there's, there's, there, there's, there's a phrase that we use called faux rich, right? If I... <laughs> UX and uh, somebody that's that's faux rich and this is this is not all bad. Sometimes it, it works out, but um, the the faux rich person is is a uh, is a uh, a wannabe or a uh, emulator, right? So that particular person wants to show you that they're successful without having actually achieved success. So they'll buy an exotic, uh, probably a luxury car. I'll pick on BMW because they had that reputation. So a BMW and a Rolex. Now I got a Rolex. I drive a BMW. Guess what? I'm successful. Do you know what percentage of people? I don't know. So I'm not going to be able to tell you the answer. <laughs> How many, what, what the percentage of people that are truly successful that deserve and should be in that car and wearing that watch out of all the people that do it? They're faux rich. They're faux wealthy. 
they don't have, they shouldn't buy those kinds of things because they're not putting themselves in a position of being uh, liquid enough to maybe take some chances in life. They're strapped to that image that's not doing them any good. Now, having said that, I was the guy that buy, bought, bought the expensive car and expensive uh, watch and many other people like me because they want it so bad that that's inspiration for them. And that's a goal for them. You know, it was, I want to buy this watch. I want to buy this car and I want to keep going. And because of their desire and need to have those kinds of items, they'll work their butts off in order to get it. So that's, you know, sort of the positive side of that. Um, the, 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 the people that uh, buy luxury products, some products more than others, are people that spend all of their money on that particular product to show you that they're successful. Thank, thank you, Rick. Rick, last luxury question. What luxuries do rich people spend their most their money on the most? From your experience, like the, the wealthiest people, which ones are they buying the most? Is it yachts? Is it cars, planes, two finger rings? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, you know, that's, 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 a, that's a fun question. That's an interesting question. It really depends on, um, I, I, when I was 12 years old, my neighbor and I used to talk about the things we would buy when we grew up and we got money. And we had very specific things we would buy. And, uh, uh, you know, so I think it comes down to, what is it that you really wanted when you were a kid that you could now could, could afford? Um, uh, one, one of the guys that uh, uh, we did a lot of business with is uh, Craig Barrett, uh, Craig Jackson from Barrett Jackson Auctions. He told us years ago that the muscle car market was going to explode because the people that had either wanted or had really crappy rusted out versions of a lot of these cars, when these cars uh, now are uh, more uh, accessible because they have the money now, they're going to be gobbled up. And sure enough, the muscle car market, just as he predicted, went out of the, went through the roof. So maybe you buy a muscle car because you wanted one when you were a kid. Um, the uh, the founder of uh, Yankee Candle, who lived in Massachusetts, went to the boat show and he was looking for a sea ray for about about 50 feet, which is probably a million two. And he wound up buying a 165 foot yacht and upgraded from there. You know, he's, a, he's the kind of person that didn't know which side the steering wheel was on, you know. Uh, so he had a uh, significant wealth in a massive uh, mansion. W what am I missing? I need a yacht. I got everything else. <laughs> Probably has a cars and sort of yacht was his next step. You know, uh, some people don't go to yachts. Uh, you know, we, we, we learn about, uh, through, through the people uh, from net jets and from, uh, jet companies. Uh, what are the qualifications? What's the demographic of somebody that, that that starts with the fractional usually and then goes to buy a jet. What does that profile look like? Well, who is that person? It's not just money. It's not just money criteria. You know, it's not just demographics, it's psychographics. There are some people that have the money, would never buy a private jet or fly private. And other people that barely qualify, they have to fly private, right? So you really, really have to understand, um, you know, the psychographics of the, of the people and what kind of products they buy. Um, some people get turned on to things. Uh, I've had conversations with people and I, I collect watches. We were in the watch business. Some customers demand we buy them. So I've collected a lot of watches over time. And so I engage in conversation, you know, this watch and why I love it and the movement. Imagine this was all just a block of steel and it's got a moon face to it. Tell you when the moon's coming out, it uh, chimes. It, uh, wow. Next thing you know, I see the guy with a watch. Now he's got a collection because he, he, he got pulled into it from some uh you know conversation that he his takeaway was i am now hooked on that and so some th some things are obvious you know cars uh, yachts a uh, plane but things that uh people like to collect a lot of the watch people remind us that a man has very few choices when it comes to jewelry something to wear maybe you got a chain maybe not maybe you have a bracelet maybe not most don't so the watch is the only thing they put money in for an accessory. And so that's why guys like watches. Mm. And um, it's, it's so small. You can store a lot of value in such a small thing. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's a very uh, good as uh, very good thing for, for many people who are trying to 
squeeze as much value without having to pack a whole garage yeah. full of stuff. I mean, yeah. just, just take like a watch, for example, right? Mm -hmm. like you take a Petit Philippe, it could be worth a million dollars and it's yeah. this big, right? Like how, how many other products you'd have to buy a, a yacht that's like i don't know how, how big how big of a yacht can you get for a million dollars right to prove the point here the same thing well well some 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 yachts are uh uh 30 feet and they're a million dollars today it's a lot yeah. bigger than than something the size of a watch though right oh god yeah the the, the, the that, that is a very good point and, and in fact there was somebody that actually started a business with watch trading and he got so successful with trading watches out of the business of selling exotic cars mm -hmm. his point was in his in his videos and his presentation see this right here my bookcase is four million dollars in watches <laughs> if i put four million dollars in cars i'd need three parking lots you know right i can ship it i can buy it i can send it and i'm in the watch business you should be too and and guess what the last couple of years watches pre-owned watches have exploded Wow. So that's a case where we talked about is, is, is luxury, you know, an investment. Well, if you, if you, if you bought, if you had a, uh, an exotic car, a luxury car or a watch for sale, the last two, uh, in your possession, uh, you, uh, you would have made money. I was just talking to somebody the other day with a, a Porsche that he bought from a dealer. I think he said he paid 62,000 and, um, the dealer called him after a month and said, do you want to sell that car? He said, no, I just bought it. And he said, well, I'll give you 82 for it. And the reason he said no, and the reason why it was so valuable in the first place is when you, when you buy a car, you have the money. We talked about faux rich, but if you have the money to buy a, a, a Porsche and it's your third or fourth, fifth car, this guy's very, very successful. It's not about the 20,000. You want the damn car. What do I want the 20,000 for? I, if what you're telling me is true, I can't go then buy another car. Cause I'll be paying more. So I want the car. So it, it's very difficult to find things sometimes in the luxury market because people don't have to sell them. And that's the, a great the price point. goes up because, because, because the, the cars were uh, Lamborghini at one point only made a couple hundred cars a year. So when they're gone and all of these people, uh, newfound rich gobble up the cars, the only thing left is to buy something pre-owned. And when there's a surge in interest, the market goes up and they get ridiculously overpriced. It will come back down again, but you could have made money in that business too. Thank you, Rick. This was a brilliant, brilliant conversation. Uh, Rick, Rick, just want to go back to publishing for a moment, maybe 20, 30 seconds. What does a typical day for a publisher look like? Can you just walk us through that about 30 seconds from the time you, you get up as a publisher? I know you wear a lot of different hats because you own a, another company as well. Yeah. Um, you know, publisher, as we said, uh, talked about is often a, uh, uh, also the owner. So I am, uh, I just relinquished my publisher title uh, to, to uh, a new uh, hire three months ago as a vast amount of knowledge, but let's just say I'm the publisher. Um, my job as the publisher, when the publisher is in control and not the editor, which we spoke about, is to uh, keep an eye on the deadline. It, it, it's, 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 it's a 12-month publication every 30 days. Your magazine, and if I th when I thought about this too much, I got really scared and said, what am I thinking about? But every 30 days, you have to take a legal pad and turn it into a magazine in your hand in 30 days. So you've got to make sure editorial is lined up. You've got to review it. It's got to be proofed and edited. You have to check in to make sure editorial is in and on schedule. You have to check to make sure that creative has the uh, photography uh, scheduled and the photography will be ready on deadline. Uh, ad sales is the biggest thing. How are we tracking? Um, what are the uh, what are each of the individual uh, sales funnel pipelines look like? Will we make it? Do we have to adjust the book size? Check in every week on whether or not the book size is correct. We go up or down based on sales. Um, make sure the paper is available. We've had a hard time making sure paper was available. Thankfully, we're kind of a big player where we are. So we, we were always taken care of. But some publishers went out of business because they couldn't find paper. Um, so, uh, make sure the distribution and the newsstand numbers and circulation and subscribers all are tracking well in these 30 days. Um, and of course, when you're in publishing, as we talked about, there are a lot of other things going on. So if that's not enough, you get a, 
two events that happen in the same month. You got to make sure that you're selling tickets. You got to make sure you sell sponsors. You got to make sure that you have all that you need for that particular show or that event. Uh, and then, the, then there are the uh, often surprises. Uh, you know, big client doesn't want to advertise, can't make the issue. Somebody can't get creative. So it's, it's, it's more than just your average day. It's sort of the look at what happens during the course of a cycle. Um, but your, your average day, most publishers are just looking for business activity. Are we on track? What decisions do we have to make? What offers are made to, to us that we want to accept or decline? Um, what uh, uh, do salespeople need? Do they need a phone call? Do they need a hug? Do they, you know, are they, uh, uh, you know, Yogi Bear, one of my favorite quotes I've used a lot is half the game is 90% mental. We're selling an intangible, right? Your, your mental health affects how many sales come in. You're not, no one walks into your showroom and buys something. You have to go all the time selling a service and a reason why they should do business with you. So all of those things have to be in place. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I mean, for, for in that short amount of time, yeah, you, that was a packed full, full answer there. So thank, <laughs> thank you, Rick. <laughs> yes. Appreciate it. All right, Rick, uh, next question. How, how do you get on the front cover of a magazine? Maybe 30 seconds. Well, so, so the front cover of a magazine is designed for one, one purpose only, and that's to sell copies. So the person that decides on what's in the cover in my company, it's, it's a, a committee of, of all of the top uh, leaders of the, uh, of the organization. Each I want to hear from in terms of why they think uh, the creative director may, may present six covers. I want to hear the reason why each one of them picks a cover. Sometimes it's unanimous. It's obvious. We want this cover, but it's, it's, it's designed to sell magazines um, and there's all kinds of tricks, you know, is the, uh, is the person on the cover looking at you? Do they look happy? Do they look like you want to pick up the magazine and look at, or do they have a scowl on their face? Do they look like you just, you just, I can't look at it anymore. Is it a product? Is it, <laughs> is it blown up in such a way that I want to grab it? So it's, it's pick up ability, a new word I made up. You want to pick up the magazine and you want to read it. Um, a lot of magazines sell uh, newsstand copies. We happen to sell uh, through a controlled circulation or offer through control. Yes, we're on newsstand, but not so much. But if you take a look at uh, a magazine that has 50,000 copies on the newsstand, 100,000, a million, and you're off by a percentage uh, a point or two, that, that can be t t uh, from tens of thousands up to millions of dollars swing from another issue. So uh, how do you get on the cover? You should be on the cover to go with a particular theme inside the magazine that will sell copies. And today you help promote the magazine. Mm. We sometimes look at, well, how many uh, Instagram followers do they have? How active on social are they? What happens? Oh, this guy, this guy's got 200,000 followers. He's an architect and he's got a beautiful, all of those things today versus years ago, all factor into a decision. But most of all, we can't do it because of that. We have to do it because it's the best cover. But if there are five best covers and we can't decide, then those are the things that 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 help us to decide which one to pick. Yeah, to go to go with your thought, I know people that have over a million followers. I don't know how they got them. They don't really yeah. have any substance beyond that point alone. Yeah. And when you talk to them, it's kind of like you're better off talking to paint on a wall because there's mm -hmm. no personality there. Yeah. So going back to what you said, like putting them on the front cover, it's not the best thing. He's probably not going to sell because they have that growling face you talked about. Like, <laughs> so. Well, well, well yeah. So, so you, do you, do you sell subscriptions? Do you sell single copies? Do you sell advertising? Are people going to be uh, looking at that particular person on the cover in alignment with the mission of the magazine? Does it make sense to put that person on the cover? So all of those things factor. What are, what are we what are we doing it for? Are people going to like it? What we want is love that cover. That's a fantastic cover. Really appreciate it. We we always want to go go out on a limb. We want to. I always tell my creative people, listen. I, I, when when I was at Raw Report, and I wasn't in charge of of uh, picking the cover exclusively. Um, I was part of a committee, and the person that was always went back to, we had uh, about 75 different covers on a large wall. Each cover was in a frame and it had the sell through the amount of copies. Um, 
that were printed and the sell through rate on the newsstand. So one sold 28,000, uh, 28%, the other sold 56%. 56% was a beautiful brand new Ferrari. Um, I said, John, you can't keep putting Ferraris on the cover. I don't want 56%. I want 70%. So we have to stop looking at things that will equal 56 or 57 and start finding the 70. Let's look for the 70. Let's avoid the 28%. Sailboats don't sell on the cover. We got to get to 60 and 70%, right? We got to do better, not try to equal. So that's what you always want to do. You want to, you want to best whatever was your bet, but, but you may fall victim to having it be less good, but you got to learn from that. Thank you, Rick. Rick, what are the top three observations you made about how rich people spend their money? Maybe top three, huh? Um, so there's, there's, there's a group that, that, that I call a see it, like it, buy it. I mean, they may not be in the market, but they have money. And there's a certain emotion where they feel like, you know, I, I had a good week. I had a good year. I had a good month. I, I sold X company. I'm going to buy something. And I've got some friends that, uh, you know, fl flip restaurants and, you know, they could, they could have uh, money that they decided to sell a business a couple of million. I'm going to carve out X percent of that and buy something, whatever the heck I want to buy. And uh, so that is, uh, that is one type of purchase they make. Um, so remind me again, that's the problem with me talking like this. I, I forget, I forget the question. What, 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 what are uh, the top three observations you made about how, how rich people spend their money? Yeah. So they spend their money. They spend their money on that. That would be one. The second thing they spend the money on is, is something that may be really personal to them. Right. Um, it may be sort of the story I told you when I was 12 years old. I'm talking to my neighbor. We loved cars. We loved uh, classic cars. We're going to buy one when we go up. Maybe that turns into a collection of cars, right? So it's it's uh, it's it's something that we always knew we wanted to do when we work hard to get the money to buy the thing. It's it's all predetermined. This is what I'm going to buy when I buy when I when I uh, get this uh, when I get the money to uh, to be able to afford it. Um, I think some people uh, I'll pick as the third one, uh, people that are always learning about doing things uh, and learning about things that perhaps are better than the things they had before, because you have the money. If you don't have a lot of money, you're not looking to necessarily spend more on something better. Did it work? Did it not break? Good, I'll buy it again. But if, if you've got a lot of money and you're interested in luxury, you may buy a particular handbag or a watch and you want it. What's the better one? What do I go? Where do I go up from here? Uh, I read an article from a cigar publisher and a guy wrote and said, Hey, I want to think about smoking cigars. Where should I start? Uh, and he said, we'll start with a 50 cent one and start smoking the one right after the last one. You when you stop throwing up after smoking. And, and so the point is, and it's really, you know, for uh, audio files and it's for, it's for watches, wine, especially don't buy the one that's $35 a cigar when you're not a cigar smoker and you can't tell the difference. I went to an audio show and there were $125,000 speakers. And the guy basically said, I won't sell these speakers to you. Come in this room. These are 50,000. If you can't tell the difference, you buy a speaker a Jensen triaxle in the 1980s was $3.99 a pair. And you're talking about speakers that are $125,000. I can't tell the difference. I can't necessarily appreciate a bottle of wine that's $2,000 from a $100 bottle of wine. So if you have that appetite, if you feel you deserve to get step up because you're tired of the $100 bottle, you've appreciated it, what's the next one? You level up. People buy because they level up. They want the next best thing maybe maybe the same brand but the but the more expensive one that's what car companies rely on that's why bmw and mercedes promotes their three class or their c class because once you get loyal they start you and then they'll keep you up to the seven class or the s class sorry rick i i, I hate to digress on this but um it just taking it at a macro level humanity right like yeah. it seems humanity humans many humans like many, most of us are they're not uh, never really satisfied <laughs> and no. i think this has a lot to do with what you just said it's kind of like it, it, pe people always want better they want to top their last thing they did and that kind of cements luxury's place in history and in, in the future like yeah. it, it probably will never go away as long as this is 
a part of our human condition to always want something better than what we did, even if what we already have was already great enough. We still want something better. So that continuous search for something better, mm-hmm. even though we don't need it per se, will always keep luxury uh, in a place for for a lot of pro- to make a lot of profit for certain yeah. people who can take advantage of that um, I, that thought there. Well, think about it. The world's fastest runner wants to be able to run faster, even though he's the fastest runner, right? A person that uh, breaks the uh, land speed record on a motorcycle wants one wants to go faster because that's how we got to the place of breaking the record. <laughs> you don't just stop. Yeah. The saddest thing in the world for the, for the person that climbs the, the world's highest mountain. Now, what am I going to do? I just climbed it. I wish I didn't. So I could climb it again, you know? So when you buy luxury and you have four levels, you can keep buying the different luxury, uh, different levels, more expensive, the next best one. For me, it was, it was, I, I believed uh, very early on that that I would have, uh, uh, you know, a, a uh, an image board, right? I would have the thing that I wanted. I would take a picture of it. I would have it pull it out of a magazine. I would pin it on a board. Uh, you know, I didn't create it. Everyone knows to do this, but I literally would look at something every single day, and I'm working my butt off, and I'm buying that. Not a, I'd like to buy. It. Wouldn't it be nice to buy? It? I'm buying that. And I bought my house that way. I bought cars that way. I bought boats that way. I bought a house I lived in. It's absolute my uh, my dream on uh, you know on a water with a dock and a boat. And I wanted I wanted to be able to um, to take my boat from my dock to the Cape of the Islands. Or ultimate goal was to take my boat to work, so that I could take my boat, tie off of the dock, and walk to my office. So. For me and a lot of people, it's about that's the reward and the reason that, and, 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 the, and the gift that you give yourself for working your butt off. Mm. That's brilliant. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate yeah. it. And by the way, is that the house that you're talking about where you're at right now? Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, you know, something I uh, absolutely love. And uh, all the kids are out of the house. I was the, uh, my friend said, you're the craziest guy I know. You but you upsized when your kids moved out. I said, well, I didn't quite move out. Yeah, well, they will, and you upsized. But uh, guess where my kids, and hopefully when they have their own children, guess where they want to hang out all the time? So it's kind Your of house. counterintuitive. You buy a big house, right? It was yeah. a Verizon commercial on uh, six months a year ago. And our, all the kids was told, yeah, we're going over Grammys. And they go, I don't want to go to Grammys. Uh, Grammys house smells. This TV's <laughs> puny, you know. And, uh, you know, th- that's what happens. You don't want to go to Grammys, small little house. So what happens if you have a, you know, a, a nice size house with a, a fun uh, downstairs playroom and a pool and a, and a boat dock? Well, the kids want to come hang out. And that's what parents want. They want their kids to want to come over. Mm, so so far point. it's worked until I get married. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Rick. Appreciate that. All right, Rick. So um, what do you think about Clubhouse? I met you through Clubhouse. Um, you know, we've had an interesting experience over there. And, uh, you know, but I, I want to hear what your, your thoughts are, which, what, what you like, what you dislike, et cetera. Well, you know, it's interesting. It, 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 I sometimes have a conversation with a salesperson, whether it's leads or whether it's a, a meeting or, uh, you know, a conference. Um, how did you do? And they say, well, I didn't sell anything. I said, well, you know, life is not about looking at a group of people the way a a wolf looks at chickens and only wants to eat them. You don't just try to sell people. It's developing relationships and developing relationships. Oftentimes, uh, my mentor once told me the path you start on may not necessarily be the path you wind up on. You may look at somebody, talk to somebody about something and that particular person you don't sell, but he leads you to a place where he introduces you to somebody that you do, right? So stop looking at, you know, am I going to sell something? Some people use Clubhouse and they actually sell products. But, you know, that can be kind of old. Oh, here comes Jim. He's peddling his stuff again. You know, people, that won't last long. People begin to drift away. He's going he's gonna to get through the number of people that are on Clubhouse that are interested and he's not going to have any, any other place to go. I think that you and I are similar and I've, and I've been on, on, on your, uh, your clubhouse room and uh, brilliant the way that, uh, you know, that, that you run that and the guests that you have. And I know a lot of work goes into that. Some people just throw up a title five minutes before, I think I want to open a club and sometimes they get lucky, but 
you know, uh, uh, I, I definitely am impressed with the way you do it. it it's, it's meeting people. It's, it's, it's sometimes practice, you know, to, to, to uh, be comfortable in front of a group of people or maybe lay out a particular idea you have. Uh, you can see if the people respond to it. So it's in some way a little test pad. But I think it's through relationships that you meet people without the intention of actually selling them. How much money did I make on Clubhouse? How many people did I meet that will be valuable for me? And once I have those people, I might do something with them later, all because of Clubhouse. So that's that's my view on Clubhouse. Yeah, I'm right with you, Rick. I mean, yeah. you've got an arsenal of just, I'm building the A-team here. That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, hey, Rick, I want to, let me pause this real quick. All right, folks, a little technical glitch. We're back. I just wanted to uh, to introduce. So we got Rick Settler. Rick, we got um, our next segment is really the template question. So I've asked everyone on here from basically, you, you name it, from Sharon Lecter. I started this whole podcast, which he's been here twice uh, to to uh, Brett Farr. And I always bring Brett Farr. I'd be such a, a Hall of Fame quarterback. Just incredible. We've had about I think seven or eight Hall of Fame speakers on here so far as well. Uh, a few of them should have been in there. But anyway, so Rick, these questions are really tying into finance. I mean, we've already covered a lot about finance, but this is covering from a different angle. Um, and also, the first one's books, because I'm, I'm a writer first. I enjoy that. So can, can one book change the world? Maybe 20, 30 seconds. Well, I, I think we, we probably have some evidence of that. I think we have proof that that is the case. Yeah, uh, some fantastic uh, books out there that have changed people's lives and multiple lives being changed eventually changes the world. So, yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you, Rick. Rick, here's a networking question for you. What role has networking played in your life? Well, quite a bit. I mean, want to hire somebody, want to find somebody uh, for, for a new position, um, networking and getting to know groups of people so that you can put out a post from the people uh, in that particular vertical space and say, hey, I'm looking for a new art director. I'm looking for a new editor. Um, if, 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 if they see that it's reciprocal, people will go out of the way to help you. So networking for me has been invaluable. Uh, finding people, um, finding uh, uh, challenging um, uh, projects that I'm working on and, uh, and networking to have uh, relationships with people that'll, that, that will either buy from you, become a, become a sale or help you find somebody else or make a connection to somebody else, hugely valuable. Thank you, Rick. And next question is mentoring important and, and who were some of your mentors? It's a twofold question. Yeah, mentoring is, uh, is, is very important. Uh, I, I didn't really believe in it until it was presented to me. So one of my first mentors was, uh, was a guy by the name of Robert Sachs and his grandfather, Horace Sachs, uh, <clears throat> created Sachs Fifth Avenue. And uh, for whatever reason, we met at a show and we were looking at cars and there was a connection, which by the way, next segment we talk about is going to be how do you network with high net worth, you know, multimillionaires and billionaires. Talk a language they're comfortable with. And if, especially if you have some knowledge about that, you'll you'll make an instant friend, right? So we talked about the his collection of Bentleys. Before you know it, he said, next time you're in town, let's go to lunch. And those lunch meetings, all at private clubs, I said, gee, I'd, I'd like to invite you to uh, to uh, to lunch. You know, let me pick up the dime. And he said, which which private clubs you're a member of? And at the time, I said, I'm not a member of a private Well, we're, we're staying at mine then. So he spent, you know, years really giving me an insight into not only, you know, wealthy people, but my family, you know, firsthand experience. Here's what I do. Here's what I thought. Here's what I went through. Here's what I buy. And, you know, I posed a question to you. So let's say the economy is going down. It's going down. You're worth, he said, I get your question. Let's say I'm worth 250 million. I'm not saying I am, but let's say I'm worth 250. My wife expects a certain present on her birthday, on her anniversary, on her Christmas, or whatever, uh, uh, you know, you celebrate whatever um, uh, what, what, whatever uh, uh, religion you, you celebrate. Um, I'm not going to, uh, and let's say the economy took me down from 250 to 180. Do you think I'm not going to buy her an expensive uh, uh, necklace? Now, it might not be 80,000, it'd probably be 20,000. Do you think I'm going to sell my yacht and not do a yacht anymore? Do you think I'm not going to fly private anymore? None of those things will change. Do you know why? I don't concentrate on how much I'm down. I look at how much money I have 
and I'm not going to change my lifestyle. I have a lifestyle and I can't give it up. So, um, you know, so uh, that, what, what was the question again, Dr. Finance? <laughs> it's about mentors. So he was my mentor. Very, very helpful. And I've had other mentors. I didn't know uh, he was your mentor. That's, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. He, he actually said, I want to be your mentor. And, and what, what can I say? I'm in the luxury business. I'm talking to the grandson of Saks Fifth Avenue. Yeah. Of course, I want to listen to what he has to say. I learned a lot from him, a ton from him. That's a it billion about dollar selling. company, right? Yeah, yeah. But he wasn't the guy that was directly involved. In fact, if you look him up, he was the sort of the castaway son, but uh, he wasn't the one that would eventually run the company. But uh, a remarkable guy. Uh, and he was in marketing and, and sales and tried to help me every way he could. I just, I just found it amazing, a guy that you know, in that start of a relationship, you, you think, is this guy approachable? How do I start a conversation? And next thing you know, he's saying, how are you doing with what we talked about last week? Do you need any help from me? I got a lead from you. How do you go from, you know, tr trying to meet somebody to somebody who's actually dedicating his time to help you for no money? And he, in fact, spent all the money. He, 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 he would only go to private clubs and I, did, I wasn't a member of any. Do you still keep in touch with him? no. I find when I tell stories about things like, you know, who's your mentor back way back when I have to add 25 years to that story and think, well, okay, he was 60 at the time. So no, I don't, I don't stay in touch with him. I don't know if anyone does. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Rick's next question. What are your favorite financial books? Yours. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's, that's, I don't even know if I have a list of financial books. I have a, I have a Money, list. Money, investing, books. business, you know, think and grow rich. You can count that as well. Yeah. I'll count think and grow rich. Yeah. I'm, 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 uh, you know, I love, uh, uh, you know, good to great. I, I, I love, I love that book. Um, so I would say that, uh, I'm really bad at remembering things, but I got a bookshelf full of them, but those, those, I, let's go with, with those two as two of my favorites. Right, After yours, you, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. All right. Um, next question is, do we need money to survive? And you're from this question, you're probably, and as you'll see from my books, uh, you're probably mm -hmm. seeing why I asked you the luxury questions earlier and the connection to it. Do we need, do we money, need money to survive? Do we need money to survive? Um, you know, I, I heard something a while ago and it was a, it was an interesting topic. Um, and somebody suggested that you need, a lot of money to live by yourself in nature and do nothing. Right. So you think, well, you don't want to be a hobo on the side of the road, live by yourself. And live. you, you want to live in a, a, maybe a cabin in the mountains and staring at a, a lake and staring at the mountains. Well, they don't give that land away. So in order to buy what you want, and want to stay there and do nothing for the rest of your life, you need money for that. Mm. Um, so yes, you, uh, you, you, you definitely, uh, you definitely need, you need money uh, for practical things, but uh, you, you definitely have to have, uh, you know, what, what do we talk about all the time? You know, how much money do I have and will it last until I die? When, when will I die? Well, I think people are living longer and longer and therefore you'll need more and more money. Do you want to keep your lifestyle the way you leave, live your lifestyle now for the rest of your life? Do you, do you want it to be enhanced? So yeah, you need, uh, you need money. Thanks Rick. Rick, next question about finance as an extension of that is finance necessary for everyone. The science of finance. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, there's a, you know, I see it in sometimes in, in North Shore Magazine when people when people start a, a business, um, and uh, one of my competitors actually to uh, to uh, uh, North Shore Magazine, um, he was selling ad pages, and he didn't wasn't uh, in in publishing for a long time. He was selling ad pages for an amount I knew was less than what he had to sell them for in order to page uh, pay, pay, pay the print bill and pay for his overhead. He, he, he was not aware of his uh, average page rate that he needed to get <clears throat> his company's financing. <clears throat> and as a result, he went out of business. A lot of small businesses 
you know, don't, they, they, they may have uh, a lot of experience in certain areas, but unless they have that finance under control, they could fail, right? Mm. Um, I learned that you get, you know, to be a publisher, a publisher is only part of starting a business. You actually have to be a business person. So there are re really smart publishers that aren't business people and, the, and they aren't successful. And I learned that starting my, uh, my, uh, my company. I, I'm not doing what I did before. Somebody else ran the company. I'm doing being a publisher and running the company. So finance is so important. Thank you, Rick. Just a few more questions. We're almost done here. Um, is having a, a, a purpose, <clears throat> how important is having a purpose in business? And second fold to that question is what is your purpose? Yeah. So, so I think, um, you know, people, uh, especially the millennials uh, did some studying about how to deal with millennials. My kids were millennials, you know, and um, so what one expert uh, told us, a, a small group uh, that they lectured about and taught us about millennials is millennials need a purpose. And you've got to come up with a purpose that makes them want to do what they want to do. They'll get bored. They want to do something else. And what am I doing here? I'm behind a computer. So you used to build things, tangible things. Today, we do a lot on a computer. So if you're staring at the computer, there's no purpose every day. You're going to, you're going to lose that person. They're going to go to somebody without a purpose. And one example that you gave me was... Um, this is a company that's, that builds cement, or rather uh, sells cement. And he, he says, what, what the heck am I going to say about a purpose for cement? And he said, what do you do? What do you use it for? What do you sell it to? He said, well, we, you know, we build bridges for it. He said, so your slogan, your purpose is that you work here and you create the infrastructure that without you and your cement would never make it possible to travel through Miami. You know, wow. Yeah. We build the bridges and roads that help. Yeah, I feel like I got a purpose, right? So uh, it's important to have a purpose because let's face it, some days are not great days working your butt off running your own company, right? So what is my purpose? You know, what, what do I do it for? I mean, that's a great question. I think I, I want to um, create a legacy for, uh, for my kids, you know? I, I, uh, I want to uh, help small businesses uh, for the North Shore, I really, I really love small businesses and boy, if I can get somebody that says you, you, you've done a great job and my business has grown. Like somebody said a couple of weeks ago, that's the purpose for putting out that book is helping businesses. You can be a publisher and take people's money, but if you really want to help people and, and make their day and, 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 and have them say you're responsible, best thing I've ever done. Um, the purpose of making the magazine is to make it work for people to help grow their business. What is, that was a brilliant response, Rick. What, what is the North Shore for those who don't understand North, North Shore? What area is that? So the North Shore is uh, roughly defined as uh, going through Boston, hitting Revere, which is the gateway to the North Shores, but their slogan is. Uh, it's from north of Boston up to the New Hampshire border and east to the ocean. Okay. But it's, it's sort of loosely defined. As opposed to the South Shore, which is like Cape Cod and all that stuff, right? Yeah, because the Cape Cod, you really don't, you, 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 you go east and west and it's still contained as the South Shore, right? <laughs> and, 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 you know, but, but the North Shore, you know, there's different interpretations of what the, what the North Shore uh, is, where it begins and ends. Thanks. So, thank you, Rick. Yeah. All right, Rick, two more questions left. What would you like to accomplish in the next 10 years or so and why? Maybe 20, 30 seconds. Yeah, I want to uh I I, I want to be able to uh, uh take what I have now and and sort of make it finite, may finalize something. Do I want to continue to grow it and 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 therefore keep adding publications and uh, take care of the people that took care of me, do something for my family? Um you know, do I, uh, do I want to, uh, I, I guess mostly I want to be remembered for, for doing something good, doing something special, right? And do I necessarily want to uh, make uh, uh, more money? Well, I realize without the desire to really want to make money, then you, you, you sort of fall victim to just taking what you got and enjoying it and and uh, maybe being complacent, and, and, and I hate that feeling. So I've, I've got to keep going and building and, uh, and feeling like I'm still doing something, being scared every day, taking things to the next level, 
and uh, keep myself going. Um, that's 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 my probably more than twenty seconds answer. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Appreciate that. It's a great great response. Next question and last question is um, about your legacy. So you mentioned it already, but what would you like to be your legacy? So your purpose was to fulfill your legacy and a few other things, but what, what, what do you actually want to be your legacy? Um, you know, I, 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 I was in a business group once and they, um, the guy came in, the speaker of the day came in and he shut the lights off and everyone was, what, 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 why did you just shut the lights off? We can't even see anything. He said, I want you to shut your eyes and I want you to think for 20 seconds. And I want you to think uh, you're in a coffin and it's your own funeral. What do you want people to say about you? I want to go around the room and I want you to hear what you want people to say, what you wanted to hear in that coffin where miraculously you could hear what they say. And that kind of, def that, that helps you to try to figure out what do you want to do from now and, and, and what, what, what do you want people to say about your accomplishments, you know? Um, and I don't know if I've totally figured that out yet. Um, you know, I would, I would love, uh, I think everyone loves to be in some way special, right? He did this, he accomplished that. Nobody else did it. He was a pioneer, those kinds of things. Um, and I think at the end of the day, um, does it have to be luxury? Well, I, I think I could go without that and just say he was a great dad, uh, great husband, great friend, that sort of thing. It'd probably be the, the, the thing that's most valuable. Thank you, Rick. That's brilliant. Rick, uh, we're going to conclude now. I want to thank you so much for being here. Uh, an honor to have you here, sir. And there's a, another example of how people who are on Clubhouse and use it properly <laughs> can find <laughs> the right people instead, instead of just trying to sell people stuff all day long, just actually yeah. look for good quality people that you want to be around. So, Rick, I'm honored to have you here. And uh, any, any last minute concluding thoughts, remarks, anything you'd like to showcase if you want to showcase your house in the back, whatever you want to do, Rick, the floor is yours. <laughs> well, I'm usually a pretty private person, but uh, I, I couldn't find the right spot anywhere else. So, uh, so yeah, you got a glimpse of my house. Um, you know, I, I, what I'd like to say is um, I, I really value our connection, um, the invite to be able to speak with you for a while. You're asking questions. I love to, love to talk, as you can tell. By the way, you, you're 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 a talker too. Between the two of us, <laughs> don't ever don't ever think uh, suggest there's, there could be a thirty minute meeting because th that that's just your side of it. Never mind me. Uh, but you know, th there's something about doing a lot of talking. You love what you do. You're passionate about it. And boy, the ones that stop talking, maybe they maybe you should get out of that business. So, I still still uh, still enjoy it. Talking about uh, things that I've done and a lot more stories and have a ball doing that. So I really appreciate you inviting me, especially with the legends that have been on uh, your your podcast hopefully i can come through with some numbers but uh thanks for thanks for the opportunity i really appreciate it absolutely rick honored honored to have you here and uh yeah i think they call that word loquacious yes yeah right right, right. i remember when i first learned that word in grade school it's like wait a minute is that me <laughs> <laughs> yeah it well, doesn't sound yeah. it doesn't sound like what it means right right yeah. right it's a yeah. blessing and it's a curse and a blessing yeah. Time, yeah agreed oh. agreed we're in the same boat well, thank you, Rick. Appreciate you being here. And I'm just going to Thanks, uh, conclude out real quick and I'll, I'll, I'll meet you. Just If you can wait there just for a moment, I'll, I'll see you in the green room in just a second. Folks, sure. you've been watching uh, Dr. Anthony Creative 4 3. You've been watching the Dr. Finance Live podcast. Uh, don't forget to look, follow, like, and subscribe. Also, check out the website, drfinance.info. And you can see the podcast. There's a podcast page. See some highlights and all the other episodes as well. This will be posted to youtube and blast out the 20 plus podcast directories by the way rick where can they find you on social media i forgot to ask that and what is your your uh, website address as well so the website is rmsmg.com um my uh social media handles can be found on uh 10k card so it's rick hyphen sedler.com and surprisingly there are not a lot of people named rick sedler so if you google me you'll, you'll yeah. pretty easily connect with me so thank, thank you, Rick. Yeah. Appreciate that. Okay. All right, folks. And also, if you want to uh, definitely check out his pub, uh, his uh, magazines, his publications as well, and, and and just go back to that section, and we'll have it listed in the description section what the exact names are. Um, also, my 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 works, folks. So I was a professor, online professor, 
My first book was The Necessity of Finance. I wrote that about 10 years ago for my finance students. Then I moved into my second book, The Most Important Lessons in Economics and Finance, 218 Principles That Should Last the Test of Time, uh, and also my final book, which had all my conclusions in here, The Survival of the Richest, a 500-plus page book, tying in a lot of subjects, uh, survival, economics, finance, biology, um, and really expanding on some of the greatest arguments in science as well. So check those books out and uh, let us know. And let us know about this podcast. Comment. Don't forget to like and subscribe also to the social media. So thanks again, folks. Look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Wait till you see what we got lined up for next week. Thank you, folks. See you again. Bye-bye now. Thank you, Dr. Vanessa.